Hello, fans, and welcome to This Day in Baseball, where we're going to bring you a full radio broadcast of today's game. And before we do that, I just want to thank Classic Baseball Radio, and there's a link in the notes where you can uh, check out their full channel. They have many, many great radio broadcasts. And while you're listening to today's game, if you want to check out much more about the game and the players, look on the links below, and you're going to see uh, links to player pages, the date the game happened, the year it happened, and the play-by-play. Enjoy the game, and check out the links while you're watching the game, and please don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that every time new content comes out, you're going to get that uh, firsthand. And thank you again for checking out this day in baseball, and enjoy the game. Stadium in New York City. This is Jim Simpson with Bill O'Donnell, and welcome to the fourth game of the 1969 World Series. The amazing New York Mets, underdogs when this series began, now lead the Baltimore Orioles two games to one. And now, the National League champions, the Mets, find themselves the favorites to win this World Series, a series not many ever thought they'd be in. Today's fourth World Series game is brought to you by Chrysler Corporation. Engineering with Care, your host for today, your local Dodge dealer. The Hartford Insurance Group and Hartford agents and brokers everywhere. Gillette, we have a new adjustable razor for a more comfortable shave. The makers of Winston, Salem, and Camel cigarettes. And by STP Corporation, makers of STP oil and gas treatment. The weather today in New York City, crystal clear skies, unlike yesterday's overcast, but also unlike yesterday, instead of the temperatures in the mid to upper 70s, today at game time, it is 57 degrees, top coat weather, with a high to be in the low 60s, or perhaps to the mid 60s. And now the color guard moves out toward the mound, and in a few moments we'll have the playing of the national anthem. In the meantime, this is a replay of the first game of this 1969 World Series. Mike Cuellar, the winningest left-hander in the Major Leagues. He won 23, and he is the winningest pitcher in the history of the Baltimore Orioles. He also tied Dave McNally for the most complete games for a club record with 18. He won that first game 4-1. to one. Tom Seaver, many say he is the odds-on favorite for the Cy Young Award in the National League certainly is the winningest right-hander in the majors, 25 victories. But against Atlanta, in the league championships, Seaver did win the ball game, but was soundly hit by the Atlanta Braves. He came on to start against Cuellar and did not last but about five innings. Gil Hodges says that Seaver is due. He has now pitched five innings just a matter of days ago. He hasn't had too much rest. Mentally, he is ready. With us again on the NBC broadcast booth, the Baltimore Oriole baseball announcer, Bill O'Donnell. And Bill, the weather today is chilly. It's my understanding that Mike Cuellar likes it warm. Jim, you're absolutely right. Of course, uh, Cuellar, who was born in uh, Cuba and is uh, very accustomed to the warmer climates, uh, normally is a better pitcher in, uh, in warm weather. However, during the course of the 1969 season, uh, Cuellar, especially early in the campaign, has pitched on days uh, such as this. And as Jim Simpson pointed out, today is crisp and cool here at Shea Stadium in New York. But as Shea Stadium is uh, most every time, uh, despite the cool and top coat weather, uh, this will be warm and an excited ballpark just as soon as this ball game gets underway. Perhaps, Jim, uh, the keys to the first uh, three games of the World Series have been the combined and great pitching efforts of uh, Taylor, Cardwell, Kuzman, Gentry, and Ryan, and also the first game starter, Tom Seaver, who, although the loser, will come back today and try to become a World Series winner for the first time. Uh, The keys to the series, uh, pitching-wise, for the Mets uh, have been exclusively the fact that they've held the likes of Blair, Frank Robinson, Powell, and Brooks Robinson to only six base hits in 44 trips to the plate. A fellow like Blair during 1969 had 26 homers, 76 RBIs. Robinson, Frank Robinson, had 32 home runs, 100 RBIs, batted 308. Powell had 37 home runs, batted 304. 
drove over 121 runs. Brooks Robinson connected for 23 homers, 84 runs batted in. And those four power guys combined have only touched the Mets pitching staff, the starters, and the relievers for a measly six base hits. Frank Robinson has gone one for nine, Brooks Robinson one for nine, and Powell three hits in 11 trips. So the Orioles in the first three games of the series have only collected five runs and 12 hits off New York pitching. The Mets, as Jim pointed out, to begin the 1969 series were decided underdogs. As a matter of fact, they were 8-5 to five underdogs. Right now, going into game four, the Mets are favored to win the series by odds of 6-5. to five. Defense has also played a great role in this series, a great role on behalf of the Mets, as well as the Orioles. Brooks Robin, for example, in game one on Saturday, made a great uh, come-in ca- uh, play on Gasper's tapper on the grass and threw him out. In game two on Sunday, it was Harrelson and Charles of the Mets who made spectacular plays on balls whacked by Buford and Dave Johnson. In that game on Sunday, Belanger and Brooks Robinson made key defensive maneuvers. And yesterday, perhaps we had the defensive gem of the series, and that was pulled off not once, but twice by Tommy Agee, once to the 396-foot marker in uh, left center against Elrod Hendricks, and then in the seventh inning, with two out and the bases loaded, A.G. took a, a double, perhaps a triple away from Paul Blair with a diving catch on the warning track in right center field. And they've been saying all day here at New York that A.G. was responsible for six runs yesterday, his first inning home run, and then perhaps the five runs that he saved with his glove. And there's something else, Bill, in that... Baltimore today, and going with the left-hander, Mike Cuellar, the New York Mets must go back to their all-right-handed lineup. And Gil Hodges, again, has gone back to nine right-handers in the lineup. And here briefly are the lineups as the players are being introduced to the crowd here under Sunny Skies at Chase Stadium now. Baltimore has the same lineup against the right-hander Tom Cheever today as they did against the winning right-hander Gary Gentry yesterday. Leading off and playing left field, the switch hitter Don Buford. In center, Paul Blair. Batting third and playing right field, one for nine on the series, Frank Robinson. Boog Powell, tied with two Mets for the most hits in the series with three at first base batting cleanup. Brooks Robinson is at third base. Ali Hendricks, the catcher, batting sixth. That cheers for the Mets are now being introduced. Dave Johnson bats seventh and plays at second base. Mark Belanger is at shortstop. Mike Cuellar to repeat 23 and 11 on the year, and he won that first World Series game in Baltimore, four to one over Seaver, the pitcher. For the New York Mets, here are all of the right-handers. Tommy Agee leads it off and plays in center field. Bud Harrelson will be at shortstop. Cleon Jones, a 340 hitter, but one for 12 for the series in left field. Don Clendenin, three for seven, leads everybody in hitting 429 for the number of times at bat, three for seven. Clendenin will bat cleanup. Ron Svoboda will be in right field and bat fifth. Ed Charles will be at third base. Jerry Grody, who has three hits like Clendenin and like Boog Powell to lead all players on both teams, will catch and bat seven. Al Weiss, a 2.15 hitter who is two for four and has two RBIs in the series, will play second base and bat eighth. And Tom Seaver, 25 and seven, will pitch and bat ninth. Interesting thing, the leading RBI men in the series are Al Weiss, a 215 hitter with two RBIs, and Gary Gentry, a pitcher who only had one RBI all last year. The umpires have now walked out to home plate. Shag Crawford of the National League will be behind home plate. Lou DeMuro of the American League will be at first base. Lee Wire of the National League at second. Hank Soar of the American League at third. In left field, Frank Sicori of the National League. And in right field, Larry Knapp of the American League. Now Gordon McRae walks to behind home plate, turns and faces the crowd for the playing and singing of our national anthem. We don't have an orchestra today, so I have to sing this, the national anthem, uh, what they call a cappella, which means alone. But the way you sang it yesterday, I won't be alone. I've lowered the key, so let's show the country how the Met fans can sing our national anthem. Oh, 
say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting in McRae as behind the mound, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Color Guard under sunny skies at Chase Stadium in this America's greatest sporting event, the World Series. And Bill and O'Donnell and I say hello to you all of the armed forces across the seas, wherever you may be. And we'll say we'll be back with more pregame color right after this message. Dusk comes fast to the Rockies once the sun drops behind the peaks. Now, the lights of the town turn on. I can down the dusty trail, hear them old coyotes wail. I'd walk a mile for a camel. Heading for you nowhere, gonna get real big flavor there. I'd walk a mile for a camel. I'd walk a mile for a camel. I'd walk a mile, wouldn't you? Got a wandering soul, beat up boots with a great big hole. I'd walk a mile for a camel. I'd walk a mile for a camel. This message was strictly for smokers who've never tasted a camel cigarette. Camel smokers, you know what we mean. You other guys, start walking. Game number four in a moment, but first we pause ten seconds for station identification. This 1969 World Series game is brought to you in part by Saratoga Vichy and Saratoga Ginger Ale. Sit back and relax with the Fizz Kids from Saratoga. C. Stengel, the first manager of the New York Mets, has been introduced. And Casey now winds up. With a double lipper with his left hand and throws out the first baseball to Jerry Grody, the Mets catcher. And what a proud moment it is also for Casey Stengel. Again for Baltimore. The batting order, very quickly. Don Buford leads off in left. Paul Blair's in center. Frank Robinson in right. Boog Powell, the cleanup batter at first base. Brooks Robinson at third. Ellie Hendricks, the catcher. Dave Johnson at second. Mark Belanger, the shortstop. And Mike Cuellar, the pitcher. And the Mets now take the field. Dunham will be at first base. Al Weiss at second. This is the all right-handed batting lineup of Gil Hodges, with which he won the one of the first two games. He won the second game after dropping the first. Bud Harrelson's at shortstop. Ed Charles at third. Cleon Jones at left. Tommy Agee. What a spectacular day he had yesterday in center field. Funny thing, Agee says his first catch off the bat of Elrod Hendricks was the tougher catch. His manager, Gil Hodges, said no. It was the second catch you made off the bat of Paul Blair. 
with three men on base. In either case, as Bill O'Donnell said, in New York, they'll tell you Tommy Agee not only saved five runs, but contributed a sixth himself with a home run to dead center field off a high fastball of Jim Palmer to lead off the first inning. Ron Svoboda is in right field, Grody again the catcher, and Tom Seaver, who won 25 on the year and lost only seven, but lost the first game of this World Series, is the pitcher, and Seaver has yet to make his appearance on the mound. This is baseball's biggest year. More than 28 million have watched baseball this year, and with the amazing New York Mets and the talented Baltimore Orioles in this World Series, baseball for a centennial year, as we said, is having its greatest year. Now still awaiting Tom Seaver. Let us turn it over to the Baltimore broadcaster who will bring you the first four and a half, Bill O'Donnell. Thank you, Jim, and uh, hello again, everybody. Tom Seaver now is making his way out to the mound, and he'll start to loosen up a few pitches now with his catcher, Jerry Grody. So while he starts to warm with Grody, let's set uh, the New York Mets defense for you. Charles will be at third base. Harrelson will be the Mets shortstop. Weiss will be at second, and Clendenin will be the Mets first baseman. The left fielder is Jones, the center fielder is A.G., and the right fielder is Svoboda. For those of you who are listening around the country and also around the world today who have uh, neither seen nor been at Shea Stadium, uh, the measurements down the foul lines are equal, 341 feet to left and also out to right. To dead center, it is 410 feet. The power alleys uh, to left center field, 371 feet, and then it breaks away to a deeper uh, left center field pocket to 396 feet. And the same figures prevail in the power alleys in right center, 371 and 396. Uh, the distance of the wall out in center field, uh, height-wise, up and down, is 8 feet. Uh, the Orioles, who during the regular season won the American League championship, won the Eastern Division of the American League uh, over the uh, Detroit Tigers, Baltimore won 109 ball games and lost only 53. They will lead off in the top of the first inning with Don Buford, and they'll follow with Paul Blair and Frank Robinson. Charles at third base, as uh, the Met third basemen have done every time Buford has come to bat. Charles playing third today will come right up to the grass, will play Buford wide of the line. The first baseman, Clendenin, against Buford, despite the fact he pulls, is not guarding the line too tightly. Here we go now, game four, and Seaver's first pitch. He gets the fastball for a strike on the outside corner. So we're underway with strike one to Buford with Paul Blair on deck with Frank Robinson in the dugout. The outfield shades right against Buford. Svoboda is the right fielder a couple of strides in front of that warning track. And there's quite a room on that warning track uh, back to the fence, about 30 feet of it. The coaches, George Staller at first and Billy Hunter at third. One strike from Seaver. He changes up. He goes in the dirt inside. Seaver spying Grody. Here he goes, 1-1 one, one to Buford. He's on the outside corner with a fastball for strike two call. So both of Seaver's strikes have been belt high fastballs to Buford, and both on the outside edge. Seaver, just 24 years old, 6 feet 1, and 200 pounds. He's ahead 1 and 2. His pitch is on the way. It is low. Buford began to squeeze the trigger and then looked at the low breaking ball. Two balls and two strikes. Buford in the series is two for 11. And he had his two base hits in the opening ball game with a home run and a double and produced two runs. On the year, he batted 291 in the Baltimore uniform. 2-2 two -two pitch now to be served. And Seaver to the plate against Buford. The fastball is fouled off the left field side and slicing deep out in left field. The count riding to Buford, two and two. We have fellow alums facing each other. University of Southern Cal's Tom Seaver against USC's Buford 2-2. Two and two. A changeup, cut on a miss. Seaver strikes out Buford on a let-up breaking ball into his hands and over the plate. Out number one, strikeout number one for Tom Seaver. Here's Paul Blair now, the center fielder. Blair has had only one base hit in the series. After finishing 1969 against American League pitching with 285 for an average. 
One out, nobody aboard. The windup and Seavers pitch. Here's a line drive, base hit, and it falls into center field beyond Harrelson and in front of A.G. A one-out single line to center by Blair. He roped it right over the head of Harrelson, the shortstop. Here is Frank Robinson. Robinson has one hit off Met pitching in the series. In nine official at-bats, he has also drawn three walks. Frank Robinson finished the campaign batting at 308, had 32 home runs and 100 RBIs. The check of first by Seaver works to Robinson, who swings, he doesn't get it. He got a slider on the outside corner, and Grody also made a bluff throw over to Clendenin with Blair getting back to the bag. Clendenin is policing at first base. Harrelson and Weiss playing a double play depth looking for the ground ball. Charles well off the line at third. Easy move to first base, and Blair beats the toss over by Seaver. One strike to Frank Robinson, taking a glancing peek, and a quick one out to third base coach Hunter. Now, Robinson and Blair often will play run and hit. Blair leads, doesn't go. Here's a fly ball, deep left center field, way back in left center. Agee's on the warning track, at the fence, makes the catch about two feet in front of the fence at the 396 foot marker. The ball was hit high and deep, but high enough for A.G. to get back and bring it down. Out number two in the top of the first inning. A long out off the bat of Frank Robinson. And here's the power now of Boog Powell. Powell just finished uh, his greatest career with the bat in the American League. That at 304 drove over 121 runs, was second to Killebrew in the American League in producing runs. It's two out with Blair off first base. The stretch to the belt by Seaver. A fastball is hit foul upstairs back of the plate. Powell had uh, the Orioles' longest hitting streak of the season. He hit safely in 18 straight games. The longest in the American League was by the Twins uh, outfielder, Ted Ulander. Seaver over to first base with his look, pitching Powell. He backs him off with a chest-high fastball. One ball, one strike to Powell. One on, two gone in the top of the first inning. Blair had the one-out single. He roped it to center. Harrelson shades second base from short. Weiss has back to the outfield grass, the second baseman. 1-1 1-1 to Powell. A curve is fouled off the left field side to the seats. 1-2 and two to Powell with Brooks Robinson on deck. Powell suffered uh, two injuries during 1969, and neither one kept him out of the lineup for a long time, but both were painful. He suffered a hip injury early in the season at New York, sliding into second base. Also an ankle injury late in the season at Anaheim against the California Angels. Hard move to first base, but Blair is back there ahead of Seaver's throw. Clendenin still holding on Blair. Blair started to edge into his lead and then saw Seaver not make contact. Now he does and he leads away. The one-two pitch to Powell is high. Two balls and two strikes. One of the big improvements that Powell showed this year was against a left-handed pitching in the American League. Fine left-handers like Cotton McDowell. Seaver ready, two and two. Powell waiting at the plate. Fast ball is on the outside corner for strike three. And that's the top of the first inning. No runs, one hit, one left. In the middle of the first inning, it's the Orioles nothing, and the Mets are coming to bat. Hi, this is Joe Garagiola to tell you some big news about Dodge. Last model year was a great sales year for Dodge, one of the best ever. And Dodge sales for the month of September were the best in Dodge's history. Let me tell you one of the reasons why. The 1970 Dodge Dart Swinger. It's a reasonably sized, reasonably priced car, sure. It won't put the squeeze on your pocketbook. And you can have it just any way you want it to, with six or V8 engine. 
manual or automatic transmission. You name it, and the price is still right. So don't think small. Take a good look at 1970 Dodge Dart Swinger at your nearby Dodge dealers. Join the crowd that's giving Dodge sales another big boost. But wait until the game's over and tell them that I sent you. And when you get that Dodge Dart Swinger, we'd like to remind you to drive carefully. From Shea Stadium in New York, Jim Simpson with Bill O'Donnell and Tom Seaver, who only went five innings the last time, weathered the first inning here, getting Buford leading off on a changeup curve to strike him out. Blair single to center field. Robinson backed A.G. deep in center field to haul in his fly ball, and then Boog Powell was caught looking at a fastball on the outside corner. So Seaver has gotten through inning number one of this, the fourth game of the World Series, with the Mets leading two games to none. Brooks Robinson has come over to talk to Mike Cuiar, winner of the one game that Baltimore did win on opening day Saturday in Baltimore. And now now Ellie Hendricks walks down. Tommy Agee will be the first batter, and we will take up where we left off yesterday. And that is in that Agee hit a pitch from Jim Palmer, a chest-high fastball over dead center field for the first run of that ball game, which the Mets won, of course, by the score of 5 to nothing. Agee went on for further heroics. Later in that game, hauling in drives in left center field off the bat of Ellie Hendricks and right center field off the bat of Paul Blair. Each time with men on base, the first time with two on, the second time with three on. So as A.G. does step up, and there seems to be a momentary delay, he will get a tremendous hand from this predominantly met crowd. The temperature, about 57. As we begin, the bottom of inning, number one. Buford is down in the dugout, and the trainer is bending over him. Now, what has happened to Buford? I don't know. Don did strike out at a change-up curve to lead off the first inning. And he is not in left field, and we may have a change already. But that is why we are having a delay, and they are looking at his leg. He might have a muscle cramp in his left leg in the corner of the dugout. And the umpires, that's one thing about the umpires. The office of the Commissioner of Baseball and Commissioner Bowie Kuhn has instructed his umpires that people come to see a World Series and they come to see the stars play. So perhaps a player might argue a bit more, discuss things a bit more with an umpire. An umpire will be quick to make sure that the stars stay in the lineup. And so Buford has given a lot of time to work it out. He has come out of the dugout and now trots out to left field. Mike Cuellar looks down at him. And now Bill O'Donnell with a score nothing for the Orioles. The Mets coming to bat in the bottom of the first. Tommy Agee. It'll be Agee, Jim, to be followed by Harrelson and Jones in the bottom of the first inning. Uh, Buford is okay. He's gone out to left field. He'll have Blair beside him in center, Frank Robinson in right, and an Oriole infield of Brooks Robinson third, Belanger short, Johnson second, Powell first, Henrich back of the plate, and Agee batting from the right side leading it off. A slow rainbow curve is in for strike one called. Cuellar got a knee-high strike to A.G., who has one hit in the series, and that was that home run yesterday in the bottom of the first inning. The one-strike Cuellar offering is a high curve thrown harder. One ball and one strike. Cuellar, when he is loose and when he is confident with his best pitch, will throw the screwball 60 to 70% of the time. 1-1 to A.G., a curve and a check swing ground ball to Brooks Robinson at third. Hurries his toss and in time to Powell. A.G. tried to yank the bat back. Instead, had a bounding ball go to Brooks Robinson back of the grass at third. On the slow job for Robinson at a hurry as toss, but he beat A.G. by two steps. First out in the bottom of the first inning, and here is the fine Met shortstop, Bud Harrelson. He has gone two for nine in the series. He is played shallow in center by Blair, shallow in right by Robinson. Harrelson bunts down the third base side foul. It went foul about 12 feet away from the home plate. Harrelson bunted a lot like that during the 1969 National League season. Harrelson, who is a switch slinger, batting today against Cuellar from the right side. Harrelson is two for nine in the series in the first three ball games. Baltimore won game one, four to one. The Mets came back, won game two, two to one in Baltimore, won here yesterday, five to nothing behind Gentry and Ryan. 
One strike to it. A line drive, base hit by Harrison to left field. He roped it right through the hole on the left side of the infield, and Buford played it out in left field. So both number two batters in the order have line singles to the outfield. Harrelson's third hit, and the greeting is for Cleon Jones. Jones is one for 12 in the series. The number three National League hitter batted 340 with 12 home runs and 75 runs batted in. Jones was second to A.G., knocking over Met runs during 1969. Cuellar leaning forward and uh, checking with the signs of Hendricks. Powell is holding on the runner Harrelson with one guy. The pitch to Jones. A curve is a strike to his knees. Pete Rose led the National League with 348, followed by Clemente with 345, and then Jones at 340. One strike from Cuellar setting at the belt. He moves to first base, but Harrelson, not far off the bag, was back in time. With a runner on and one gun, Belanger at short, Johnson at second, play a double play depth. Another move by Cuellar to first base, trying to keep Harrelson close. Harrelson edges a short lead against the left-hander. Cuellar now just rechecking his outfield, which shows Buford fairly deep in left against the power of Jones. Another set to the belt. Cuellar moves to the plate. A ground ball to the shortstop for Langer. Clips to Johnson one. Throw to first. It's a double play. The Oriole infield doubles its pleasure to wrap up the bottom of the first inning at the end of one in game four. It's Baltimore nothing and New York nothing. Wally Ballou inside the center field scoreboard with Bill Heberling, BSO. What's that stand for, Bill? A uh, ball strikes and outs. The three aperture job with minimal pressure. Uh-huh. And I'm told you use regular right guard. Right. Uh, these are close quarters in here, and your regular right guard keeps me fresh all day. Leroy there is in charge of runs, hits, and errors. He prefers your right guard antiperspirant. Two kinds of people, two kinds of right guard. What was that, a ball or a strike? Well, this balloon not distracted me. I didn't see the up. Now look at the mess you've got me into. Some men have average size hands. Some men have big hands. For men with average hands, Gillette introduces our new adjustable razor with an average size handle. For men with big hands, Gillette introduces our new adjustable razor with a long handle. Both new razors have nine precision settings. Gillette figures a more comfortable razor in your hand means a more comfortable shave. Shea Stadium, New York City, top of the second inning. Brooks Robinson, Ellie Hendricks, and Dave Johnson to face Tom Seaver and Bill O'Donnell. It'll be interesting to see when Hendricks comes up. Strictly a pull hitter until yesterday when A.G. made that great catch on him. How Tommy plays him today. All right, we'll watch for that, Jim, and we'll also watch now as Seaver faces Brooks Robinson. Brooks has been held to one hit by the Met pitching. Produced 23 home runs, drove over 84 in the American League campaign. Brooks bats from the right side. Fastball strike. All the fastballs that Seaver has poured through for strikes, he's kept everything low and to the knees of Oriole swingers. One strike pitch coming to Brooks Robinson. A breaking ball is outside. Seaver's delivery has come uh, from three-quarter style. He's facing Brooks Robinson right now with Hendricks to follow. Leading off the top of the second inning, Robinson swings and hits a bounding ball. One hop to the shortstop, Harrelson. Digs it out, throwing plenty of time to retire Robinson. First out in the top of the second inning. Here is Elrod Hendricks, uh, the Baltimore catcher. One for seven in the series. Yesterday, when uh, Hendricks was batting against uh, the third-game Mets starter, Gary Gentry, Gentry uh, threw Hendricks quite a few change-ups. And let's see now how the right-hander Seaver does against him now. The right side of the infield pulled back deep, and the outfielder in right, Svoboda, also pulled to right and deep. There's the change-up outside. It didn't get the corner. One ball and no strikes. So Seaver starts... A similar pattern like Gentry did yesterday to Hendricks. His wind-up in the 1-0. Fastball. He swings. He misses. That's the ball on his drive. 
deep right center is A.G. Backed over into left center is Cleon Jones. 1-1 to Hendricks. He fouls it off to our left and way back upstairs. One ball and two strikes. Hendricks the batter to be followed by Dave Johnson. Seaver, a 25-game winner. The most wins by any pitcher in the major leagues. He's ahead of Hendricks. Zips in the one-two offering. He's low inside, and uh, Hendricks had to back off it. Two balls and two strikes. There is no score with one out in the top of the second inning. Two-two to Hendricks. Here it comes. Breaking ball is low. Three balls and two strikes. Since Hendricks is strictly a pull hitter, and that's the Mets book on Hendricks, Charles at third plays him extremely wide of the line. Three and two, the pay pitch from Seaver. Fastball is outside. He loses Hendricks. The Orioles have their second base runner in the ball game. Blair had a first inning single. Hendricks walks on three and two. With one out, he's at first base. And the batter will be Dave Johnson, who is hitless in the series. Johnson had seven home runs during the year, 57 runs batted in, and batted 280. And he was third in the American League in doubles, following Oliva and Reggie Jackson. Short lead by Hendricks off first base. Seaver to the plate. Here's a ground ball right to Harrelson. Charges. Flips the second one. Throw to first. Is late. It's not in time. The ball was hit slowly towards shortstop Harrelson. He charged quickly, made an alert quick pickup right at the grass, turned and fired to Weiss for the force play at second base on the sliding Hendricks. Weiss got rid of the ball as quickly as he could. First baseman Clendenin made the long stretch, but Johnson beat the throw for the attempted double play. Two out now, still a runner at first base. Now it's Johnson there, and the batter is Mark Belanger. Belanger batting eighth in the order. Seavers peak to first base. Pitching Belanger low for ball one. Belanger, one of the comeback ball players in the National League, raised his average 79 points from what he produced in 1968. The 1-0 to Belanger is on the inside corner of the knees. A strike is called. Belanger's American League average was 287 compared to 208 a year ago. The look to first by Seaver. 1 1 to Belanger. Here's a fly ball out to right field to the foul line goes for Boda. And Svoboda can't get to it. It's in the seats just off the foul line in fairly deep right field. By the time the ball landed foul on the seats, Johnson had scampered all the way to third base. Belanger will now come back to the plate. Down on the count to Seaver at one and two. The Met outfield playing Belanger as an opposite field hitter. He'll punch the ball a lot to right field. And Svoboda playing towards the foul line in right field. A.G. way to right center. Jones way over to left center. Seaver now has Brody's target in side. One two pitch on the way with the runner going. Brody throws to second base high, but it's in time. The tag is made by Harrelson. Johnson ran. The throw from Brody to Harrelson was up to his head. Harrelson pulled it down, came down quickly with the tag, and Johnson is out stealing the catcher of the shortstop to retire the side. At the end of an inning and a half, it's Baltimore nothing, New York nothing. It's too Yankee doodle. Yankee doo-doo, one, two, down, riding on a pony, stuck a feather in it, and called it it macaroni. What did he call it? Macaroni. (laughs) After a child has been in a bad accident, how can an insurance company help him to laugh again? The Hartford knows that money alone can't do it, but people can. Doctors, specialists, therapists when they're needed to treat the injuries, to soothe the shock. And getting them there fast can also help. 
<laughs> at the Hartford, we know it's often the kind of help you bring in at the start that determines whether or not there'll be a happy ending. Insurance by the Hartford. We try to keep things simple. Carmel, along with Jim Simpson, we start the bottom of the second inning. Cuellar to Clendenin, and the ground fell over towards third and in the box seat. One strike to the tall right-hand swinging Mets first baseman Don Clendenin. Clendenin was the only one in uh, the first ball game to get two base hits off Cuellar. He also had a second game opposite field home run to right. It's Clendenin, Svoboda, Charles here in the Mets' second inning. A fastball is strike two called belt high to Clendenin. Clendenin, uh, the book on him, he's a high fastball swinger. He crouches towards the plate and has a deep knee bend. Two strike delivery is in the dirt inside. One ball, two strikes to Clendenin. Deep left center is Buford against the right-hand swinger. Screwball is low and away. Two and two. Clendenin well off the plate and deep to the box. Crouching and leaning towards the plate out of that crouch. Cuellar to Clendenin two and two. He backs him off inside to his knees. Three balls and two strikes. Clendenin has doubled, singled, and homered in the series. K pitch from the left-hander, Mike Cuellar. Here's a high fly, deep left field, way back to the fence, over the fence in left field. Clendenin, second homer in the series, better than 360 feet away. Yesterday in uh, game three of the series, in the first inning, A.G. played home run to put the Mets ahead. Now it's Clendenin to start the bottom of the second inning with a long ball to put the Mets ahead again. Here's an outside pitch to Ron Svoboda, ball one. Svoboda is one for seven in the series. And the home run whack by Clendenin has really put this Met crowd alive here at New York. Here's a curve that's high. Two balls and no strikes. In the first two innings, thus far, Cuellar has not thrown too many screwballs. Normally, that is his very best pitch. He's behind Svoboda 2-0. and oh. Here's a ground ball to the hole at short. Up with it is Belanger. His long throw in time by two steps, and Svoboda is gone. One out in the bottom of the second inning with a run home on the Clandenon play. The Mets' third baseman stepping aboard, and that's Ed Charles. Charles played third base in games one and two in Baltimore against left-handers Cuellar and McNally. Against Cuellar again in game four. Here's a foul behind the plate to the upper deck. One strike to Ed Charles. Charles is in the middle of the box. Waves the bat from the right side. Cuellar's wind up. Here's a bounding ball. One skip to the shortstop. Belanger digs it out, throws high, and it's pulled down by Powell for the put up at first base. Svoboda has bounced to short. Charles now bounces to short. Two away. And here is the scrappy New York catcher, Jerry Brody, who showed the strong arm in the top half of this inning, throwing out Johnson's attempted steal at second base. Brody has two hits in the series, has knocked over a run. Right-hand swinger, swings, and he misses for strike one. The Mets ahead one to nothing, batting with two out and the bases empty in the second inning. Low inside is Poyar's next pitch, one ball and one strike. Getting back to Clendenin, 
During the season, only four of Don's 12 home runs for the Mets were hit in this ballpark. The others were hit on the road. Quayar winding, working one and one. Inside for ball two. Brody is seventh in the order, and Weiss is on deck. At the moment, Quayar appears to be a little bit annoyed as he just took a quick glance to the Oriole dugout. Ball two, strike one, and the pitch. Swing and a miss. Brody tried to chase an outside pitch and punch it to the opposite field. 2-2, two, two, the count to Grody. Cuellar leaning forward, rocks back and rifles in the 2-2 two, two pitch. Strike three on the inside corner. Grody knows it and walks right back to the dugout. So Clem Dennon's home run, and that's the second inning. At the end of two innings of play, New York won, Baltimore nothing. Tell me, are you a tire kicker? The kind of driver who, when his car's in trouble, kicks the tires, lifts the hood, and scratches his head until some good Samaritan comes along? Tell you a secret. Most drivers are. Most drivers don't know much about fixing cars. And that's no crime. But they should know about engine pollution. You see, the more you drive, the harder your engine works. And the harder your engine works, the dirtier it can get. And the worse it runs. So you fight pollution in your engine with the anti-pollution team. Phillips 66 gasolines and Trop Arctic motor oil. And by fighting pollution in your engine, they help keep pollution out of the air. So you get a better running engine and we all get cleaner air. Kick that thought about a bit. The anti-pollution team. Only from Phillips 66. Friends, take it from me, Bill O'Donnell. There is not a better team in the country than Phillips 66 Premium Flight Fuel and famous Trop Arctic Motor Oil. At Phillips 66, it's performance that counts. Now, Bill, the Mets are not supposed to be a hitting ball club, but in this series, Clendenin has two home runs, Tommy Agee has one, and Ed Cranepool has one. The only Baltimore home run was by the switch hitter, not necessarily a power hitter, Don Buford, the first time a Baltimore Oriole, Buford came to bat in the first game of the series. So the Mets are not only out hitting them percentage-wise, 194 to 133 as a team, but out homering them 4 to 1. Jim Belanger up to the plate again. He was batting in the top of the second inning before Johnson was out stealing. Brody to Harrelson. Belanger up again to start the top of the third. He backs off from an inside Seaver fastball. One ball, no strikes to Belanger. He chokes the bat off the knob. He'll be followed by Cuellar and Buford. Winding, Seaver works 1-0. and Curved strike, he kept it on the outside edge. One ball and one strike. Now Shag Crawford, uh, the plate umpire, coming over to the Baltimore dugout. And he does some shouting at Earl Weaver, and Earl Weaver follows uh, Crawford out. Undoubtedly, Weaver has been barking out of uh, the Oriole dugout. Crawford and Weaver still going at it back of home plate. Either Weaver or some member of his ball club in the dugout had been getting on Crawford. And Crawford probably heard too much of it and decided to go to the dugout and tell Weaver about it. Bill, there's a constant difference of opinion between American and National Leaguers in calling balls and strikes. A National League umpire will walk, work off the inside shoulder and many times will call what many people figure a strike that is far off the corner on the outside corner. And that last curve low from Seaver was off the outside corner or just on it. Weaver thought it was off it. Crawford thought it was just on it. The American leaguers stand directly over the catcher and look down. All right, back in play with Belanger ready to take on Seaver at one ball and one strike. Here's the pitch from Seaver. Fastball, little off the outside corner. Two balls and a strike. And I think Weaver's all through. He's disappeared from the dugout. The 2 1 delivery. Here's a line drive, base hit to the opposite field, out in right field, played on the first skip by Ron Svoboda. Belanger leads off the top of the third with a base hit to right that is hit number two off Seaver. Here's the Oriole pitcher now, Mike Cuellar. 
Now looking into the dugout, Bill, Weaver is whispering something to Brooks Robinson, perhaps uh, order of command now that he's departed. Clendenin holding and now coming down the line. Cuellar squares, tries to bunt, and let's see what Crawford has called. He's called ball one. He claims that uh, uh, Cuellar yanked the bat away in time. One ball and no strikes. Cuellar, for a pitcher, did drive in uh, quite a few runs during the season. He drove over five runs. Belanger gets his lead at first base. Clendenin comes down the line. Charles at third. Here's a looping fly ball. Base hit out to left center field and a base hit by Cuellar. Cuellar had ran his hands up the bat, squared, then yanked the bat back, took a half cut, and has an opposite field base hit to left. So Belanger went opposite field to right, and now Cuellar, faking a bunt, yanking the bat back, has an opposite field to single to left field. Two straight base hits now off Seaver here in the top of the third. The Orioles have two on. They've got something on the fire, and they bring on Don Buford, the leadoff batter. The Mets are leading by a score of one to nothing. Don Clendenin hit a bottom of the second inning home run out to deep left. Clendenin comes to the grass, well inside first. Charles is up to the grass at third. Two runners lead at second and first. Buford waiting. He squares, and he takes the strike down the middle above his knees. One strike to Buford. He was fanned on a breaking ball by Seaver back in the first inning. Belanger, a lead at second base. Cuellar, a better lead off first base. One strike to Buford. And the pitch is in the dirt, but Grody blocks it and keeps it right in front of home plate. Grody got the mitt down on that low dirt pitch. Buford had a notion to bunt, laid off the pitch, and Grody did a fine job blocking it and also keeping the ball right out ahead of him. Billy Hunter, probably the third base coach, Billy Hunter is probably running the Oriole Ball Club right now. Belanger short lead at second. Harrelson cheating towards him and trying to keep him close to the bag. 1-1 to Buford. Seaver with a long look to second base. Buford swings away to to Clendenin. Throws to second for one out, and that's all they get. A hard smash to the right side. Clendenin was at the grass. Yanked the glove up right by the ear. Pulled down the hot smash. Threw to second to get the force play on Cuellar. Belanger has advanced from second to third, and Buford is aboard at first base. So Buford swung away, took the full cut, sent a hot shot ground smash to Clendenin, who was playing tight. Clendenin did not budge and took the ground ball immediately, fired to second base and made the fourth play. Runners are at the corners with one away in the top of the third. Blair single to center in the first inning. Two on, one out. Mets lead by a run. The Orioles have the tie run at third with Belanger. The stretch by Seaver, and his breaking ball is way outside in the dirt, and again a fine save by Grody. Seaver trying to work his way free out of a top of the third inning jam. Belanger led off with a base hit, Cuellar followed with a base hit, and Buford has just bounced into a force play. Blair, two hits in the series. The look at the corners by Seaver, setting to the belt. The 1-0 is swung on and missed by Blair. One ball and one strike. Seaver, who has an excellent fastball and comes out of the uniform with his delivery, and uh, very often it's difficult to pick up the Seaver's pitch. Belanger off third, Buford off first. Blair on the 1-1. Bunts up in the air to the mound. It takes one bounce. Seaver recovers. Throws to first base and in time. Belanger holds at third and Buford goes to second. Blair bunted but pushed the ball up in the air. Seaver came off the mound. It bounced to the third base side of the mound. Took one hop. Seaver recovered. Threw hard to first base. He retired Blair on his toss to Clendenin. Belanger stayed camped at third and Buford has advanced to second base. And the batter is Frank Robinson. Two out now. Frank Robinson flied to center field in the first inning. He only has one hit in this series. 
Frank Robinson, who has been named three times in the last four years to the American League's All-Star team. Both runners in scoring spots. Buford from second, Belanger a couple of steps down the line from third. Seaver winds fully, throws a high fastball to Frank Robinson. One ball, new strikes. The Orioles have three hits, the Mets have two hits, but the Mets lead one to nothing. Clendenin's wallop has been the big blow in the early innings. Seaver, quick wind up, 1-0. and oh. Here's a high pop up to the right side of the infield. Clendenin is in foul ground off the first base side, grabs it. Seaver has pulled out of a big hole, retiring three in order after giving up two leadoff base hits. At the end of two and a half innings of play, New York won, Baltimore nothing. Hi, this is Joe Garagiola. And I want to tell you that Dodge's September sales were the biggest in Dodge's history. Isn't that something? And there's a brand new Dodge model that's going to give Dodge sales a big boost this year. That's Challenger. New entry in the sports compact field. Gripping the road with a wide stance that says, Solid and priced to compete with the pony cars. Now, that alone makes Challenger different. Everything from a gas-saving 6 to Dodge's tremendous 426 Hemi V8. And Challenger has more models to offer than any other in its class to boot. Stop around at your nearby Dodge boys. See Challenger for 1970, one of the reasons for Dodge's spectacular September sales record. Now, at your nearby Dodge dealers, and tell them that Joe Garagiola sent you. And when you get in that new Challenger, the Dodge boys and myself would like to remind you to be sure and drive carefully. Jim Simpson with Bill O'Donnell under clear and cool skies in New York Shea Stadium. The fourth game of the 1969 World Series. The Mets lead it one to nothing on Clendenin's home run. And Al Weiss, who was a hero of the second game, a 215 hitter, will lead it off in a ball game that has had everything, including manager Earl Weaver of Baltimore, being thrown out of the game, Bill. Al Weiss starts it off, and Cuellar starts him off with a fastball strike. Weiss is the number eight batter. Seaver will be next, and then A.G., the leadoff batter. Bottom of the third, game four of the World Series. The Mets ahead one to nothing. Breaking ball is inside of the right hand swinging Weiss. Ball one and strike one. Weiss has two runs batted in in this series. A 1 1. Swing and a miss on the screwball from Cuellar. A ball and two strikes. Cuellar throws fastball, slider, hard screwball, soft screwball, and short rainbow curve. Ground ball to Brooks Robinson backing up a third. Off his glove, recovers, makes no throw to first base. A hard ground smash, well inside third. Brooks tried to play the short hop. It hit off his glove, off his leg, came to the grass. Brooks picked it up, looked to Weiss going to first base and realized he had no play. The batter now will be the Mets pitcher, Tom Seaver. We're waiting to find out whether it's a hit or an error on Brooks Robinson. Weiss off first base and nobody out. Seaver squares, bunts over the pitch and misses strike one. A base hit has been given to Weiss. Weiss short lead at first base. Seaver down on the count, one strike. Squares, the pitch is low, and it's dug out by Hendricks. One and one to Seaver. Looking now for some flashing signs from third base coach Eddie Yost. Yogi Berra on the other side, keeping his eyes glued to the runner Weiss and also to Cuellar's motion. Seaver squaring again. The pitch is low, and he holds off it for ball two. Two balls and one strike. Harrelson, Clendenin, and Weiss have the base knocks off Cuellar. Cuellar leaning forward, now setting back to the belt. His 2-1 pitch is an attempted bunt, and it's missed by Seaver. Two balls and two strikes. 
On every pitch to Seaver, Robinson from third, Powell from first, have been charging down the lines. Robinson at third stays tight. He is not on the grass. Powell goes back to the bag to hold against Weiss. 2-2 pitch. Seaver squares. Bunts. And foul tips it, and he's out of there, bunting on a second strike. Seaver tried to bunt on the second strike, got a piece of it, fouled it off, and that gives Cuellar a strikeout. Two strikeouts for Cuellar. Out number one in the bottom of the third, and here's the leadoff batter who was the toast of New York last night, Tommy Agee. Agee's first trip in the first inning. He grounded out third to first. Weiss is the runner. Powell is still holding. Weiss a short lead against the left-hander Quayar. His soft curve is in for a strike looking to A.G. Deep left for A.G. is Buford. Straight away, normal depth center is Blair. Frank Robinson pushed back in right. The 0-1. Here's a line drive. Base hit to the alley in left center. Run down by Buford. Weiss a big turn at second and stays there. A.G. has his second base hit in the series. It is the second hit off Cuellar this inning. So two Mets are aboard with one out, and the batter will be the shortstop, Bud Harrelson. Hendricks is making a visit to the mound to talk to his uh, left-hander, Mike Cuellar. Has a short visit now and walks his way back. A.G. just ran the single to left. He's at first base. Weiss at second with one out. Harrelson had the Mets' first base hit of the ball game in the first inning. The infield playing halfway on the right side to Harrelson. Set on the pitch. A swing and a foul ball right back uh, behind the catcher, Hendricks. Jim Harden, a right-hander, begins warm-up activity in the Baltimore bullpen out in left field. Yesterday, in the early innings, when Jim Palmer was having control problems, Harden and Lopez were up quite a few times. Two runners are leading at second and first. Cuellar has one strike to Harrelson. A curve, a ground ball to second baseman Johnson, pulls it down. Hurried throw to Powell, just in time at first base. Powell was playing well off the first base side. Johnson had a run far to his glove side near the outfield grab. Harrelson tried to punch a base hit to right field, and as Powell came back to the bag, he had to turn quickly and take the throw from Johnson. But the two runners advance on the ground out by Harrelson. A.G. goes to second. Weiss has moved to third. There are two gone, and the batter is Cleon Jones. Jones bounced into a first inning double play. Jones is one of the members of the Gil Hodges New York Mets who is not platoon, and of course with good reason. He has batted well against both right-handers and left-handers. A.G. at second, Weiss at third and two out. Here's a foul right off the end of Jones' bat, just outside the Mets' first base dugout. Against left-handers, Jones batted 344 during the season, 338 against right-handers. Poyar with runners behind him at second and third, glancing to third. His full windup on the one-strike pitch. A ground ball to Brooks Robinson to third, digs it out, throws an in time to first baseman Powell. Brooks Robinson went to his glove side. Jones has been thrown out. In the Mets' third inning, no runs, two hits, two left. After three innings of play, New York won, Baltimore nothing. Flair writes the way you feel. Feel angry? Right angry. Flair. Feel happy? Right happy. Flair. Feel sad? Right sad. Flair. Flair writes it like it is. Writes the way you feel. Flair writes very, very small. Flair. Or ten feet tall. Flair. Flair is different. Flair has a smooth, tough nylon point that stays sharp. Flair. Flair. Some men have average size hands. 
Some men have big hands. For men with average hands, Gillette introduces our new adjustable razor with an average size handle. For men with big hands, Gillette introduces our new adjustable razor with a long handle. Both new razors have nine precision settings. Gillette figures a more comfortable razor in your hand means a more comfortable shape. The New York Mets came within a couple of steps of breaking this, the fourth game open. With two men on base, Davey Johnson made a fine play on Bud Harrelson's ball, and not everybody would have had the ground ball off the bat of Cleon Jones. But the great Brooks Robinson did, so it's still 1-0. New York has removed to the fourth and Boog Powell and Bill O'Donnell. Thank you, Jim. Powell has been up once against Seaver, and he looked at strike three against the right-hander in the first inning. A curve. He took something off it, and he gets strike one. Seaver has two breaking pitches. He throws his slider hard, and when he throws his curveball, he takes a little something off it. He did and got the strike to Powell. Powell to be followed by Brooks Robinson. One strike to Big Boog. Fastball backs him off into his knees. One ball and one strike. Seaver during 1969, uh, people figure that uh, the longer he threw, the better his fastball became. In the late innings, his fastball was as good as he was in the early innings. Curve, a ground ball to the right side. Fielded by second baseman Weiss. Throws to first in time to Clendenin. Powell retired on a chopping ground ball to second baseman Weiss. Third that's the first out in the top of the fourth inning. The Mets are leading one to nothing, and the batter is Brooks Robinson. Robinson rolled out short to first in the second inning. Seaver giving Brody a long look. Now winds, and he works. Swing and a miss on that hard slider. He kept it down into the outside edge. Brooks Robinson on the one-strike pitch from Seaver. Swings and it's a towering fly ball down the left field foul line. It's going to foul ground. Chased by Charles and Harrelson. It is Charles for the putout down by the rolled-up tarpaulin about uh, 50 feet away from third base. Brooks Robinson has fouled out. Number 10. Two away in the top of the fourth. Since Seaver gave up base hits to Belanger and Cuellar in the third inning, Seaver has now retired five in a row. Here is Hendricks, who walked on a 3-2 pitch in the second inning. He bats from the left side, and he pulls. So Clendenin guards the line tightly at first base and is deep. A check swing on a low Seaver fastball. One ball and no strikes to Elrod Hendricks before Elrod Hendricks was picked up uh, by the Orioles and was playing in the Mexican League. He was known as the Babe Ruth of Mexico. A change up and a big balloon pitch is low. Seaver just changed up and threw that big balloon rainbow toss and it dropped right under Hendricks' knees. Two balls and one strike. Seaver back quickly again. With the fastball, bounce to the right side. Backhanded by Clendenin. Throws to Seaver low, but Seaver gets it. By both Seaver and Clendenin. Clendenin, a backhanded pickup, threw low, and Seaver may have been spiked by Hendricks as he, as he hit the bag. Seaver had to reach down and make a good catch. That wraps up the top of the fourth at the end of three and a half innings. New York one, Baltimore nothing. Second floor, refrigerators, formerly 109. Fire in your home today and head to replace everything. This is what you'd find when you went shopping. Third floor, living room sofas. Formerly $210, now $225. Going up? Basic things have gone up 5, 10, 20 percent. Then there's the cost of your house itself. This is why the Hartford invented Inflation Guard, the first homeowner's insurance policy that protects you against inflation automatically. To keep up with rising replacement costs, the Hartford boosts the value of your policy every three months. Sixth floor, rug. New Inflation Guard. The way prices are always going up, can you afford to be without it? Insurance by the Hartford. We try to keep things simple. Right now, we pause 30 seconds for station identification. 
WGY, Schenectady. The difference between the right word and the wrong word, it's been said, is like the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Which brings to mind the difference between Saratoga Vichy and its drab alternative, tap water. It's a choice between a unique, fascinating mixer or the same lackluster liquid with which one washes automobiles and oneself. Saratoga Vichy in that green bottle with the vivid yellow label. As Don Clendenin steps up, here in the fourth inning for the New York Mets, who lead one to nothing, a note here, Earl Weaver ejected. Nobody can remember Bill O'Donnell, a manager ever being thrown out of a series game before. Don Clendenin swings and misses on Cuellar's screwball offering strike one. Clendenin, who has two home runs in the World Series, game two and game four today to begin the, t- the bottom of the second inning. One strike to tall Clendenin. Swings and misses the other screwball. We say the other screwball because uh, Cuellar threw the hard screwball to set up Clendenin and then threw him kind of the soft screwgee. Two strikes to Don Clendenin to be followed by Svoboda. Two strike pitch. Low outside. That's the ball and two strikes. In the fourth inning, it's a run, four hits for the Mets. No runs, three hits for Baltimore. Cuellar rocking back. Comes forward, one and two. Strike three on the outside corner to the tall Clendenin's knee. A strikeout starts off Cuellar against the Mets in the bottom of the fourth inning. It is Cuellar's third strikeout, and here is the right fielder, Ron Svoboda. Svoboda grounded out, short to first, in the second inning. The outfield plays him straight away. Svoboda up towards the front of the box, batting from the right side. Swings, and he misses another screwball. So now on the fourth inning, Cuellar leaning with the best pitch that he's used all season. He did not throw the screwball too much in the early innings of play. His one strike fire. Another screwball and a swing and a miss for strike two. All of Cuellar's screwballs to Clem Dannon and Svoboda have been on the outside edge of the plate. He's been biting the corners and the Mets have been swinging and not connecting. Svoboda on the 0-2. Hits a ground ball, past the mound, over second base, and out to center field. So Cuellar, who was way ahead two strikes, made too good of a pitch. It looked like he tried to waste a low fastball, but put it up into Svoboda's belt. A one-out single up the middle, and the batter is Ed Charles, the third baseman. Five hits now off Cuellar by the Mets. The check of first by the left-hander Cuellar throws low for a ball to Charles. Game five of the World Series here tomorrow. It will be a matchup of left-handers, Dave McNally against Jerry Kuzman. 1-0 to Charles. He has to sit down and twist away, and he may have been hit by the pitch. Crawford has not motioned him to first base as yet, and I think Charles is claiming he was hit on the hand. And Crawford is not allowing Charles to go to first base. And Gil Hodges is walking out to to home plate to also check on Charles and perhaps check with Crawford. Gus Marsh, the New York Mets trainer, is also out there to look at Charles' hand. And now Hodges has a few pleasant words uh, with the plate umpire, Shag Crawford. In the third inning, Crawford thumbed out the Oriole manager, Earl Weaver. And as Jim Simpson commented a couple of moments ago, everybody in the press section to our right has gone back and uh, checked on their history and their memories of World Series in the past, and nobody remembers a manager ever being thumbed out of a World Series before. So on the check swing by Charles, the ball glanced off the bat, then, according to Crawford, hit Charles on the hand. So it's simply a foul tick strike. One ball, one strike to Charles. The ball hit on the bottom of the bat and then off the left hand. Shortly to first base by Svoboda. The look in the pitch is low from Cuellar. Two balls, one strike. 
The Oriole infield leaves the hole open on the left side between Brooks Robinson and Belanger. Johnson playing over near the bag at second base. 2-1 to the right-hand swinging Charles. He swings and he misses for 2-2. Two and two. Charles took a healthy cut and really let the air out of the bag. 2-2. Two and two. There's one away in the bottom of the fourth inning. The vote it goes. The pitch is swung on and missed. Hendricks rose to second. In time for the put out to Johnson, who made the tag on the sliding Svoboda. So Charles strikes out. The Orioles get the double play on the throw from catcher Hendricks to second baseman Johnson. In the Mets' fourth inning, no runs, one hit, and nobody left. After four complete, it's New York 1, Baltimore nothing. This 1969 World Series game is brought to you in part by Saratoga Vichy and Saratoga Ginger Ale. Sit back and relax with the Fizz Kids from Saratoga. From New York, this is Jim Simpson with Bill O'Donnell, and this is the fourth game of the 1969 World Series. The Mets lead in the series two games to one. They lead the ball game one to nothing on Don Clendenin's second home run of the series over the 358 mark in left field. That came in the second inning. One run, five hits, no errors for the Mets. No runs, three hits for the Orioles. No errors, and Tom Seaver to lead off in the fifth by pitching to Davey Johnson. Johnson has been up once, and he bounced into a force play back in the second inning. Seaver goes to the plate with a breaking ball. He's in the dirt with an outside low. Now, Seaver, when he's taken something off that uh, curveball of his, a lot of them have found the dirt low to Oriole batters. 1-0 to Johnson. The fastball fouled right back. One ball, one strike. The Orioles are at the lower third of the order. Johnson, Belanger, and then the pitcher, Claylar. The Mets are leading one to nothing. The Orioles batting in the top of the fifth. 1-1 one, one delivery. Swing and a foul. He was jammed by a fastball into his hand. It's Dave Johnson beginning the top of the fifth inning. Seaver's curve. Here's a looping fly ball back into shallow left. On comes Jones. Makes a diving catch in left field. Leon Jones has just made the fielding gem of this ball game. A looping fly ball and a tough play for Jones. Charged in, put the glove down right on top of the grass and held onto it right in the fingertips. And he did not trap it. He held onto it held it up in the air and showed the left field umpire, Frank Sikori, that he stayed with it. So Johnson has been retired on a fabulous catch by Jones. And the batter is Mark Belanger, another right-hand cutter. He's curved and he bunts in front of the plate. Picked up by Grody. Throws in time to first base. Belanger tried to butt his way on, bunted towards the first base foul line about eight feet away from home plate. Brody charged out, smothered the bunt, and has thrown out Belanger for out number two. Mike, Quayar. So the scrappy Brody made the alert pickup and the strong toss. Two gone on the batter will be Mike Quayar. Quayar single to left field in the third inning off Seaver. Two out, bases clean, top of the fifth. Pass ball is right down the middle. He rifled it and buzzed it to the belt of Quayar. Seaver winding. Pitches again 0-1. Another fastball, this time cut on and miss. 0-2 to Quayar. Seaver's fastball humming here on the top of the fifth inning. He winds again. Two-strike pitch outside. He has thrown three straight fastballs to Quayar. One ball, two strikes, two gone, top of the fifth inning. The wind up and the one two. Low outside, a breaking ball. Two balls, two strikes. Two two from Seaver. Swing and a miss on a fastball. And Seaver has his second straight one two three inning. At the end of four and a half innings of play in game four, New York won. Baltimore nothing. Hi, this is Joe Garagio. You want to know something? Last month was the best September for Dodge sales in their history. And one of the reasons is the new 1970 Dodge Charger. 
And this year's Charger has a new model with a bench front seat. Now, you've never seen that in a Charger before. And you'll like it, especially if you're a family man. And you'll like all the other goodies you get with Charger. Disappearing headlights, vinyl trim, outstanding good looks. But if you've got real performance on your mind, you just got to see and try Charger RT with Dodge's great 440 Magnum V8 as the standard engine. Now, before you decide on any new car, see and drive the new 1970 Dodge Charger. One of the reasons for Dodge's big sales surge. You could be Dodge material. And when you get in that new Dodge, the Dodge boys and myself would like to remind you to be sure and drive carefully. Bill O'Donnell along with Jim Simpson in the middle of the ball game here at New York Shea Stadium. And as we go to the bottom of the fifth inning, it's the Mets. One run, five hits, no errors. Baltimore, no runs, three hits, and no errors. In the bottom of the fifth inning, it will be Grody, Weiss, and Seaver for the Mets. We had home run power explode here yesterday. We've had home run power explode here today by Clendenin in the second inning. We had two amazing catches made in the ballpark yesterday by A.G., the center fielder. In the top of the fifth inning, we had a diving, amazing catch made by Jones in shallow left field on Dave Johnson's looping fly ball. Jerry Grody is leading off the bottom of the fifth inning, and to tell you all about it, with pleasure, here is Jim Simpson. Thank you, Bill O'Donnell. We are to throw to Grody, who is 3 for 12 on the series. He struck out looking, guessing wrong in the second and takes ball one from Cuellar. Cuellar has only given up five hits, but one of them was the home run by Don Clendenin. Left-hander won the first game of the series, four to one at Baltimore. Ready to throw under sunny skies, comes back with a breaking pitch, which is fouled off. Now down in Baltimore, Cuellar started out with the screwball. And a simple explanation of what the screwball is, to a right-handed batter, it will go down and away from the right-handed. Then he went to the curves and the fastball later in the innings at Baltimore. Here, he started out with more curves and fastballs. Now going back to the screwball. Swing and a miss by Grody, and it's one and two. Baltimore having a tough time scoring against strong New York Met pitchers. And it is the Mets who have supplied the power since the first game, not the Orioles. They are ready. Back again with the fastball, and Grody strikes out for the second time, this time swinging. And that's the fifth strikeout for Mike Cuellar. Mike has not walked anybody and facing these nine right-handers, and here is Al Weiss, who on the series is three for five, has walked twice, driven in two. He has started with Gary Gentry and now Don Clendenin, who has second, added his second RBI today with a home run. Strike one called from Cuellar. Not yet on deck, Tom Seaver, the pitcher. Wind blowing from left to right. We are taking a long time looking at a sketcher. Hendricks is now ready in throws. Ground ball between the third baseman and shortstop. Fielded by Buford. And Al Weiss is now four for six on the series. And two for two in this game. That's the second time a Seaver comes up. In the last two innings at Cuellar has had a man 0-2. He had Svoboda 0-2 in the fourth, and Weiss 0-2 here in the fifth, and both times made his pitches a little too good and gave up the base hit. Seaver was called out, running foul, but the third strike in the third. Failing to move the runner over, he'll try to do it again. Robinson coming in, bunts the ball foul behind the plate as both Blue Powell and Brooks Robinson charging from first and third. And a game such as this, and the ones that we've seen lately in which Baltimore, after getting four runs on Saturday, got only one on Sunday. None yesterday, had none today. A second run for the Mets, a big second run, and for the Orioles, they cannot afford to give it up. A one-strike pitch. Seaver standing there as, though, there as though to swing and will swing, but the ball is off the corner outside. It's one and one. Steps out and looks down to Eddie Yost again, the third base coach. Yogi Berra at first. Jack Crawford. The National League umpire behind the plate. Threw out manager Earl Weaver of Baltimore back in the third inning. Nobody can remember if the manager's ever been thrown out of a series game before. And it was a quick thumb. 1-1. Seaver still to swing. But the Langer has a chance for the double play. Scoops it to Johnson. Johnson back to first. Two down. And no run. One hit. 
No errors and none left. And at the end of five, the Mets still lead. one nothing. Lee Ballou on the field with some baseball greats, finding out what kind of people use which kind of right guard. First, Ricky Llewellyn, who uses right guard antiperspirant. Rick, tell us about your great groundskeeping team. Well, our primary role is protecting the infield from rain and precipitation. How? By covering it with a tarpaulin. And I'm proud that our crew broke the record for covering an infield with a tarp. Twenty seconds in the raging downpour. Congratulations. Well, they had a lot of desire in spring training. They worked hard. And we're able to put it all together this year. About right guard, Rick. See, wetness is my mortal enemy. That's why I employ right guard antiperspirant. It helps keep me dry and stops odor so they don't offend the guys. Like uh, Tex here, the best little foul line painter in the majors. Thanks, Rick. I'm a right guard regular man. It tops the league in odor protection. One shot of right guard regular keeps me fresh all day, letting me concentrate on foul lines so straight I often get applause. Two kinds of people, two kinds of right guard. Wally, meet Chuck from the top crew. He's had a great year despite being hobbled by a muscle pull. Along with Jim Simpson, Bill O'Donnell back with you at New York's Shea Stadium. The Mets are ahead in game four by a score of one to nothing. When Jim and I were offering our pregame comments, uh, both about today's game and also a little bit about uh, the history of the first three games of this series, we chatted about how effective the Mets pitching had been against the power fellows in the Orioles' attack, namely Blair, Frank Robinson, Brooks Robinson, and Powell. After the first five innings of this fourth game, coupled with the first uh, three ball games, net pitching has held the likes of Blair, the two Robinsons, and Powell now to only seven base hits in 52 at-bats. Buford to lead off the top of the sixth inning. And to tell you all about it, Jim Simpson again. Don Buford is two for 13 on the series. Got us two hits in the first game. The first one, a home run on the second pitch he saw, also a double in that same game. And Buford over two today. Was caught looking on a change-up curve. He had a vicious ball into the ground to the right side of the plate, but Clendenin went high to glove it and threw on to second. To pull the force on Cuellar back in the third inning. 0 for 2 today and takes a breaking pitch that's too high. And it's ball one. Buford to be followed by Paul Blair and Frank Robinson. As the Orioles are looking for runs, and Seaver's very tough, back with a fastball, and Buford swings on and misses. Strike one. One and one. Jim Palmer, yesterday's loser, is a winner today. Happy birthday to the Baltimore pitcher who is 24. 1-1. One, one. Fastball fouled back by Buford. A switch hitter in batting left, of course, against the right-handed Tom Seaver. 25-game winner throughout the season. Won the first game over Atlanta, 9-4, to four, but was relieved in that one. And failed to last after five in the opening of the series down in Baltimore. 57,367 outside from Seaver. It's 2-2. And that's a bigger attendance than we had here yesterday. Seaver ready, ground ball, Glenn Vernon backing on it. Seaver over to cover, the other handed throw, and the play at first. And Buford is out. Yesterday we had 6,335, and I think you get the idea. There are plenty of Mets and fans here in Shea Stadium. Blair singled on a 2 2 fastball to center back in the first inning and bunted and was thrown out. Not sacrifice bunting, but bunting attempting to score Belanger from third back in the third inning. Not a suicide squeeze. And Belanger had to hold on to third, and Blair was thrown out by Seaver. One to nothing. New York. We're in the sixth inning, and Seaver facing Paul Blair. Breaking pitch, curve, bounces in front of the plate. Ball one. Blair is now one for 14 on the series and season. Finished not hitting too well, but then when they got to the league championships, Paul blossomed once again. Fastball, but high, and it's 2-0 to Blair with Frank Robinson on deck. Robinson came up with two men on in the third and fouled out. Back in the first, he flied deep to center field, A.G. on the warning track. Seaver ready and throws low again, and it is 3-0 to the tying run, Paul Blair. 
Beaver steps off the mound, faces center field, adjusts his cap, wipes his brow, and now steps back. 3-0, and Blair has his sign from Billy Hunter, now running the ball club since manager Earl Weaver's been thrown out, and this one is right down the middle. Strike one, three and one. Now Blair takes a look again at Billy Hunter, third base, the coach. Temperature game time, about 57 degrees. Here's the 3-1 pitch from Seaver, and it's off the corner, and it's ball four, and that's the second walk given up by Seaver. Right fielder, Frank Robinson. Frank Robinson, as we said, has flied deep to A.G. and has fouled out, and Frank Robinson is one of those men that very seldom, if ever in his career in the major leagues, got the bunt sign to move the man over. This is the fella, even though he is one for 11 on the series, can untie this series right now. Blair leads off at first base. Seaver's ready. Stretch, the look, and the throw. Breaking pitch hit high in the air in the infield, but Harrelson at shortstop says he's got it. And takes it two down. Well, twice with men on base in the last two times he's been at bat. Robinson has popped out once in foul territory to Clendenin and now to Harrelson. Here is Boo Powell with three base hits. Only one man in the series has more, and that's Don Clendenin with four. Powell was caught with a fastball in the outside corner to strike out in the first and hit a curveball and grounded to Weiss at second in the fourth. Boog had 37 home runs during the regular season and a monumental 121 RBIs. Three for 13 in the series. Seaver ready, throws way outside, ball one. Blair still perched at first base, but now with two down after drawing the walk from Tom Seaver. On deck, Brooks Robinson, who has contributed a fielding play to get Mike Cuellar out of trouble. Big curve, stays outside, and it's 2-0 and now to Boog Powell. And Seaver finds himself down to the very dangerous Powell. Big, strong, 240-pound left-handed hitter. One of the mismatches of the century yesterday was when Powell and Weiss tangled, or rather Harrelson tangled at first base. Interference was called outside with the fastball, and it's 3-0. One run, six hits, no errors for the Mets. The one run, Clendenin, second homer of the series. No runs, three hits, no errors for the Orioles. And it is three and oh, and if Powell should walk, Blair would advance to scoring position down to second base. Let's see whether or not Boog is taking on three and oh. He's swinging, ground ball. It is fouled at the plate and off the left foot, apparently, of Boog Powell, who is using his bat as a crutch now hobbling about. Now it's his right foot. So it is three and one. And there's daring baseball for you and gambling baseball. What the Orioles are playing, they haven't been able to score off Mets pitching and with the big, strong Boog Powell, the left-hander facing the right-hander on three and oh. And the one nothing ball game that gave Boog Powell the green light to swing for the fences. Three and one. Now all back in and ready. Seaver's ready. Blair leads off. Blair's running on the 3-1. He swings and misses again, and it's 3-2. So Billy Hunter, the acting manager, had Paul Blair off and running on 3-1. Jim uh, Powell is still limping on that uh, foul ball that hit him off the right foot. Uh, earlier, uh, earlier in the season at Anaheim, uh, Powell suffered a very painful uh, injury to his ankle and an ankle injury that kept him uh, out of a lineup for quite a few days, and he's feeling now pain on the other foot. Three and two, two out. Blair will be off and running for sure this time. And Boog Powell had a three and oh, swung at the three and oh pitch, the three and one pitch, fouled them both off. Ready now, Siever checks to Blair at first, knowing full well that he'll be on his way. Blair has taken off. Here's the pitch. High drive, center field. A.G. over to his right, not too deep. Taps his glove and takes it to the third out. No run, no hits, no errors, and one man left. In the middle of the sixth, the New York Mets continue to lead Baltimore one to nothing.
when a company buys an expensive new piece of equipment to improve production, it can be buying an expensive new source of accidents, too. That's why it's always a good idea to bring in a man from the Hartford. The Hartford has over 200 loss control specialists on call at any time for any of its customers to help them set up control measures and programs for safe operation of machinery and daily activities. At the Hartford, we know it's possible to prevent most accidents before they happen because we have respect for the equipment and even more for the men behind it. Insurance by the Hartford. We try to keep things simple. Let's pause 30 seconds for station identification. WGY Schenectady. Saratoga ginger ale is not Saratoga Bishy with ginger flavor added. We're not sure where that rumor got started, though we have our ideas. In any event, what Saratoga ginger ale is, is a quite unusual, delicious drink with its own identity altogether. It's gingery without being snappish, mellow without being gooey, altogether luscious. But then the Saratoga people do everything in good taste. Jim Simpson with Bill O'Donnell and Tommy Agee swings on the first pitch. Brooks Robinson comes to his left and has plenty of time to throw him out. And there's one out in the Mets' sixth inning of this one nothing ball game. And now it is the first time in the game that a Met has been swinging on the first pitch. Here's Bud Harrelson, who's hit a 2 2 pitch for a single to left. And was thrown out on a close play by Johnson, who went back on the grass. Powell was off the line, and Boob Powell narrowly didn't get back to first base in time to get Harrelson, but he grounded out. But foul, and just did squeeze foul. Speaking of the Orioles, who wound up the year as a team hitting 265 with 779 runs. 175 home runs, be advised, is scoreless against Mets pitching. In the last 17 innings, they've had only one run in the last 28 innings. It's this year. Reading 1-0. Here's the pitch. High into the infield. A.B. Johnson on the grass at second base, backing, looking, and taking it for the second out of the sixth inning. Left fielder. We'll bring up Cleon Jones. Hit 340 during the regular season. But thus far in the series, is 1 for 14. The last time he was up, he grounded out in the first inning, but the last time he was up, there were men on base at second and third, and Brooks Robinson ranged to his left, got the glove on the ball, and threw him out with a patented Brooks Robinson play. Van Denen's home run, the second of the series, the only run of this, the fourth game of the World Series. Cuellar in the first game gave up six hits. He's given up six hits in this game, but he trails one nothing. Ground ball, hard shot to Belanger. Has a little trouble with it, but recovers in time to throw out Jones. No runs, no hits, no errors, none left. And now we've gone six full innings, and the Mets lead one nothing. Some men have average size hands. Some men have big hands. For men with average hands, Gillette introduces our new adjustable razor with an average size handle. For men with big hands, Gillette introduces our new adjustable razor with a long handle. Both new razors have nine precision settings. Gillette figures a more comfortable razor in your hand means a more comfortable shave. You can take Salem out of the country, but... You can't take the country out of Salem. Salem, the taste that's country soft, country fresh, wherever you light up. So take a puff. It is springtime. You can take Salem out of the country, but... You can't take the country out of Salem. Bill O'Donnell along with Jim Simpson and our very able producer, Len Dillon. Six inning totals, one run, six hits, no errors for the Mets, no run, three hits, no errors for the Orioles. And here's the equally able Jim Simpson. Thank you, Bill. Here's Brooks Robinson to lead it off in the seventh inning. Time running out for the Orioles, but they trail one nothing. Brooks Robinson, one for 14. And Seaver Reddy throws him a breaking pitch outside and low. It's ball one. 
Brooks, back in the second inning, hit a hard shot on one hop to Harrelson, who threw him out. And then Ed Charles caught his foul ball. And here's another pop foul, but this one, I believe, will be out of play. Grody is in, and it drops very deep in the stand behind home plate. Ed Charles caught his foul ball in the fourth inning down near the top in left field. Brooks, upon hitting the foul, never left the batter's box, is standing there even now, although Grody has not gotten back to his catching position, swinging the bat, feet planted, staring out at Tom Seaver. This is a big game for the Mets, naturally, to go out in front 3-1, to one, but for the Orioles, who would like to even it up. Fastball is outside, and it's 2-1 to one to Robinson. And the Orioles only need a run. But Robinson, Powell, Frank Robinson, Paul Blair have not been producing in this series. Seaver ready. And throws. Foul again. It'll make the seats again. And it's 2-2. Brooks was 7 for 14 against Minnesota in those league championships. And one game was 4 for 5. That was the first game. It's Baltimore went 13 innings to win. A thriller. Here's the 2-2 pitch from Seaver. Ground ball. Charles charges in. Takes it on the second up. Throws on. And Robinson is out. Here is Ellie Hendricks. Walked on the 3-2 pitch and grounded no, out on the fourth inning. Nick Hall now up and throwing. And if Baltimore gets something going, perhaps that will be all for Mike Cuellar. But thus far, Baltimore's not been able to get anything going. Hendricks has home run power. 12 on the year. Tommy Agee is right in right center field now where he was yesterday when Hendricks went to left center. And Agee made the first of his two great catches. Tommy says... The one off Hendricks was his best. Foul back. And it's strike one. Hendricks now one for eight on the series. Tall left handed catcher, and he and Andy Etcheberry are the only changes that manager O. Weaver makes in his lineup, depending on whether they're facing a left hander or a right hander. Seaver ready with a strike one pitch. Hendricks hits it off the fist, backs Harrelson up at shortstop on the grass. Should be the second out and is. Seaver's retired 14 of the last 15, Thank but in getting Brooks Robinson and Ellie yeah. Hendricks in this the seventh inning has looked most impressive. The ball hit by Robinson, the ball hit by Hendricks. Neither one hit well, and the batter's fooled on the pitch. Here's Dave Johnson who reached on a force play and was thrown out attempting to steal, and Cleon Jones with a diving stab at his Texas leaguer in the fifth robbed him of a base hit. Swing and a miss, strike one. The Mets won. The Orioles nothing. And as they say, who would have thunk it? The Mets fans would. The Orioles fans still can't believe it. The strike one pitch, curveball outside corner, and it's Strikes two. Johnson turns around and says something to Chad Crawford, who has already thrown his manager, Earl Weaver, out of the game. Seaver, more confident than we ever saw him in Baltimore in the first game or in Atlanta in the league championships. Has gotten stronger as the innings go on. Comes back with the fastball. It just misses outside. And some of the Met fans do not believe it did. Tom, a fast worker, is ready to go again. The one-two pitch to Davy Johnson, and he strikes out, strikeout number four. And another perfect inning for Tom Seaver. The runs, hits, or errors, or anybody left. In the middle of the seventh, those amazing Mets won. Baltimore, nothing. Hi, this is Joe Garagio. Have you seen the new 1970 Dodge Monaco yet? If you have, you know one of the reasons why Dodge sales last month were the best ever for September. Because Monaco is so big... So luxurious, so roomy, lots of people want it. Monaco is one of the roomiest of all American cars. Has new torsion quiet ride that cushions the body on its undercarriage for a new kind of silence. Yes, sir, torsion quiet ride, and that cushions the body on its undercarriage for a new kind of silence. A great car to drive, to ride in, to have parked in your driveway. And the price is right on Monaco. Just one of the reasons why 1970 Dodge sales started off on such a high note. And there are plenty more reasons. 
Your nearby Dodge dealer has a wide selection of models and colors to choose from. See them today. You could be Dodge material. Well, the Mets are now coming up in the bottom of the seventh inning, and let's go downstairs to Tony Kubek. That's for his all-time great Sam Usman Stanley. That fever looks like he's getting loosened up. Yes, he is. His uh, control is a lot better now. He's throwing uh, much harder, so he's uh, pitching uh, very well. Sam Usual, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on for this short period. Very good. Fine. Thank you very much. Let's Glenn Denon takes a big cut at the first pitch and misses, and it's Don's second home run of the series on a 3-2 pitch over the 358-foot mark in left field. That is the only run of the ball game. Right back, another swing and a miss. Last time up, Glenn Denon was called out on strikes on a screwball on the outside corner. Two strikes to him to be followed by Ron Swoboda and Ed Charles in this one nothing ball game. The Mets lead, and you can hear in the background the Met fans. We are ready. Throws. Foul ball off to the right. Powell gives chase for only a couple of steps and then sees it fall into the seats. Like two to Clendenin. The Mets have used their nine right-hander lineup for the third time in the series. They lost the first game to Cuellar with it. They won the second and they're winning this one. Ground ball right back to Cuellar who can take all the time in the world and does to throw at Clendenin for the first out. The Mets pitching has been tremendous, but then so has Baltimore's pitching. The problem has been for the Orioles, they haven't been able to score. Beaten two to one, and they're losing one to nothing. Here's Svoboda, who is grounded to short and singled on a two-strike pitch, and singles this time on the first pitch to left field. And Svoboda reaches first. Two for three in this game, and three for ten in the series. Ed Charles, the batter. One run, seven hits now. No errors for New York. No runs, three hits. No errors for the Orioles. With one out of the seven. Charles hit a hard one hopper to Blanchard short and struck out into a double play in the fourth. We are working quickly. Fly ball left field. Buford there and has it and takes the line shot for the second out. Well hit by Charles, but Buford. Was only a couple of steps away. And that'll bring up Jerry Grody, who was called out, fooled in the second inning, and struck out swinging in the fifth. Bayar has struck out five, Grody twice. Walking out on deck is Al Weiss. One to nothing, New York, with time running out for Baltimore. We're in the last of the seventh. Bayar's problem right now is Svoboda on deck. Just misses with a screwball outside. And it's one ball for Grody. In the eighth inning for Baltimore, they may go to their bench. Belanger and then Cuellar, the pitcher, is listed. And Baltimore's acting manager, Billy Hunter, might feel that the Orioles need runs, not pitching. Ground ball, two hops to Belanger, who will go on to first base for the third out. No runs on one hit. The single by Svoboda. No errors and one left. And at the end of seven complete... The Mets have the slim one nothing lead. What man can resist the clean, crisp aroma of ocean surf? Get it in new Gillette Foamy Surf Spray Shaving Cream. A new fragrance like the refreshing spray of a breaker. The foamy crispness of ocean whitecaps. If you've ever enjoyed the refreshing scent of ocean spray on your skin, you know what to expect in new foamy surf spray by Gillette. Take the plunge today. One morning, Wally Buckley discovered he had a case of the nubs. The nubs? The nubs. The tiny little part of his beard his razor couldn't get. They're all over my face. Fortunately, the Gillette Techmatic razor gets rid of the nubs. Techmatic adjusts to shave you closer. Techmatic gave Wally the closest shave he ever had. No nicks, no cuts, no nubs. Boy, that was close. Techmatic by Gillette. It gets the nubs. Before we go to the top of the eighth inning, we pause 30 seconds for station identification. 
WGY, Schenectady. The difference between the right word and the wrong word, it's been said, is like the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Which brings to mind the difference between Saratoga Vichy and its drab alternative, tap water. It's a choice between a unique, fascinating mixer or the same lackluster liquid with which one washes automobiles and oneself. Saratoga Vichy in that green bottle with a vivid yellow label. From New York Shea Stadium, Jim Simpson with Bill O'Donnell, top of the eighth inning. The Orioles trail one to nothing. Mark Belanger will lead it off, and Dave May, who batted for and walked for Jim Palmer in the seventh of yesterday's ball game, is on deck and will bat for Mike Cuiar, who is all through for the day. Seaver ready to throw to Belanger, who swings and fouls the ball at the plate. So Cuiar worked seven innings, gave up one run, the home run by Clendenin, seven hits, struck out five, and walked nobody. But Tom Seaver counted on to throw a gem of a ball game sometime and throwing one thus far here in the fourth game of the World Series. Breaking pitch, hit high in the air to the infield. Allison circled back, came in, now on the infield grass and takes it for the first out. And that will bring up Dave May. As we said, he walked yesterday on the season hit 242. Three home runs, 10 RBIs. Utility outfielder for the Baltimore Orioles. Ladies and gentlemen, for Baltimore, batting for Cuellar. The Orioles will have one more big shot, barring a rally here in the ninth inning, when they'll again go through their two, three, four, five batters. And a chance to squeeze one run from Tom Seaver and the New York Met pitching staff just to tie it. May ready. Seaver throws fastball low, and it's ball one. May hardly swung the bat at all yesterday in drawing a walk. From the tiring Gary Gentry. Back again, swings and misses this time, and it's one and one. The Orioles, who had six singles in the last two games, including now, have nine singles in the last almost three games. Breaking pitches low from Seaver, and it's two and one. Ed Watt is up and throwing and probably will come in in the last of this eighth inning in relief of Cuellar. Seaver, the fast worker, back again. Throws the fastball, and May swings and misses on it to even the count of two apiece. Two balls, two strikes to May. In the top of the eighth. The Mets, for the first time this morning, were favored to take the World Series, but not favored to win this game. But they're winning it as May strikes out. at a low fastball and struck out and that's the fifth strikeout for Seaver. Don Cardwell has just gotten up and started to throw in the Met bullpen. The first activity we've seen there this afternoon as manager Gil Hodges as a veteran ready just in case. Two out in the eighth and here's Don Buford. And we'll repeat again the only extra base hits that Baltimore has had came in the first game when Buford homered and doubled. Struck out in the first on a change-up curve. Hit a high chopper that forced Coyard second into third. That's ball one. And grounded to Clendenin, who threw to Seaver covering in the sixth. One and oh to Buford, who has power enough to tie the game, but fouls this one back. And it's one and one. In the third game... How's this for research? In the third game of the 1935 World Series, Charlie Grimm, manager of the Chicago Cubs, was ejected. A 1-1 pitch. High in the air. Should end the inning. Ed Charles waves everybody away at third base. Says, I've got it, and does. And they go down in order. No runs, hits, errors, or anybody left. In the middle of the eighth, the Mets won, and the Orioles nothing. Do Yankee doo Yankee doo doo, one two, and riding on a pony, stuck a feather in it and called it macaroni. What did he call it? Macaroni. 
After a child has been in a bad accident, how can an insurance company help him to laugh again? The Hartford knows that money alone can't do it, but people can. Doctors, specialists, therapists when they're needed to treat the injuries, to soothe the shock. And getting them there fast can also help. At the Hartford, we know it's often the kind of help you bring in at the start that determines whether or not there'll be a happy ending. Insurance by the Hartford. We try to keep things simple. Along with Jim Simpson, Bill O'Donnell back with you at New York Shea Stadium. And when the Mets come to bat here in the bottom of the eighth inning, they will face right-handed Baltimore reliever Eddie Watt. Watt made more trips out of the Oriole bullpen during 1969 than anybody else. He walked from there 56 times, picked up 16 saves, more saves than any other member of the relief staff. Watt's one loss record, five wins and two defeats. And Watt also had the very best earned run average of any member on the Baltimore staff, just over a run and a half a ball game. He picks up for Cuellar, who was lifted for pinch hitter May in the top half of this inning. Cuellar worked seven good innings, gave up seven hits, but a very damaging blow was delivered by Clendenin in the second inning to lead it off to give the Mets a one nothing lead, and it's been like that ever since. Cuellar did not walk a New York batter. On the other hand, the longer this ball game has progressed, the tougher Tom Seaver of the Mets has become. Seaver has retired 18 of the last 19 batters. Now, a little bit more about Eddie Watt. What is his best equipment? He's got a better than average fastball. His best pitch is a uh, slider. When he gets ahead of batters, especially 1 and 2 or 0 oh and 2, Watt will come from strictly on top and throw the fastball. He will throw, first of all, against Al Weiss. And to tell you about it again, Jim Simpson. Here's Al Weiss two for four before today, but two for two for the day. Four for six on the series, three walks, and a couple of RBIs. And for a 215 hitter, as we keep emphasizing, that's a pretty good series for anybody. Watt ready for his first pitch in World Series play of 1969. Strike on the outside corner. Val Weiss with Tom Seaver kneeling on deck with the jacket on. One to nothing, New York. The Orioles have one more chance. Curveball hit high in the air. Buford glasses down, started back, now plots in and takes it for the first out. And here comes Tom Seaver. Seaver, number 41. Tom Seaver, a 25 game winner has received a standing ovation from the New York Mets fans here at Shea Stadium. Lost the first series game, and that's the only one that the Mets have lost. Watt ready to throw to him, and there's a strike right down the middle. One run, seven hits, no errors for the Mets. No one run, Clendenin's home run. No runs, three hits, no errors for the Orioles. Seaver grounds this ball to Johnson at second base, takes it on the third hop, and Tom isn't running too hard. He's thinking ahead to the top of the ninth. He's thrown out. Two out, and Tommy Agee, yesterday's hero, who today has grounded out twice to Robinson and is single to left. Center fielder, Tommy Agee, number 20. But the Mets can hang on in the ninth. They will have a near commanding lead of three games to one. And Baltimore would have to win the remaining three to take the series. New York would only have to win one of three, but the game isn't over yet. Watt ready to throw to Agee, one for three on the day, and two for 14, and there's strike one. Blair, Frank Robinson, and Boog Powell, and that's it. That's the heart of the Baltimore offense coming up in the ninth inning. So Seaver's not out of the woods yet. Inside, tipped off the bat of Tommy Agee, and it's fouled. Unlike Ed Charles a couple of innings ago back in the fourth, when it hit the bat and then Charles's hand, Agee apparently suffered no damage. Simply hit the bat. Two strikes. 
Big Eddie Watt in relief of Cuellar, who worked seven innings, giving up the only run of the ball game. Back again, swinging at a low and away pitch, a curveball, and Watt sets them down one, two, three. Well, the Orioles have one more chance as we move to the top of the ninth with the Mets leading one nothing. Let me tell you how it is between me and my Winstons. Yeah, me and my Winstons. Me and my Winstons. We got a real good thing, a real good taste. Yeah, me and my Winston. Me and my Winston. We got a real good thing. If you're a Winston smoker, I guess you know what I mean. If you're not, I guess you don't. That's a shame. Yeah, me and my Winston. Me and my Winston. We got a real good thing. Honestly. Wouldn't you like to feel this way about your cigarette? What are you waiting for? Change to Winston. Mm -hmm. We got a real good thing. Yeah. This is Bill O'Donnell together with Jim Simpson, and the Mets are leading one to nothing, going to the top of the ninth inning in game four of the World Series. The Mets lead two games to one. Yesterday, Gentry and Ryan shut out the Orioles. Seaver has shut out Baltimore today for eight innings. He'll go against Blair, Frank Robinson, and Powell in the top of the ninth. Jim Simpson? All right, Bill O'Donnell, and Seaver ready for his first pitch to Blair, who has walked and singled and takes a strike. And a hard slider on the outside corner. In regular season play, Baltimore was shut out eight times, never twice in a row, as they're in danger of being here in the 1969 World Series. The last 19 innings against Mets pitching, they have not scored. Blair, who is two for 14, makes another strike, almost off of that, but held back, and it's strike two, and Seaver is quickly ahead. Don Clendenin is really whooping it up at first base, charging in on every pitch, now going back to guard the line. Outside, Clendenin at the right field line and back at first base, and Charles at third base, very close to the line. The single, they will give up. The extra base hit, they don't want to give up. Seaver ready for the 1-2 pitch. Fastball, hit out to right field. Overcomes Travolta, getting a late break on the ball, but he's there now. Top to seven and a half. One out as Tug McGraw and Ron Taylor, a left-hander and right-hander, work for the Mets in the bullpen, just in case Seaver should fall to Right fielder. Since he won... Blair back in the sixth inning. There has not been a base runner. Nine men in a row since then. Here is Frank Robinson, who has flied very deep to A.G. and has fouled out and popped up and has only had one hit in the series. And Robinson does not offer the fastball low and away ball one. Robinson and Powell to follow as Blair, who has already gone down on a fly ball to Sabota can tie this game with a swing of their bats. They are powerful. Robinson hit 32 home runs during the regular season. Seaver throws accidentally fouled into the stands. It's one and one. Powell to follow hits 37 home runs during the regular season. Jerry Kuzman, winner Sunday, a left-hander against Dave McNally, a loser Sunday, a left-hander. Tomorrow's matchups in the fifth game of the World Series. We'll be on the air 12.45 Eastern time. Seaver backing. High it inside with a hard one, and it's two and one to Robinson. As in the case with Blair, so it is with Robinson, so it will be with Powell. Glendennan and Charles are hugging the lines. They're playing Robinson straight away and very deep. Tom Seaver looking for his first series win and his most effective performance since the season end. Foul back. The season ended with Seaver winning 10 in a row. He also won at Atlanta, but was not impressive, and then lost in Baltimore last Saturday. But he looks impressive. He looks like a 25-game winner this afternoon. And he's two outs away from giving the Mets a commanding lead in the series. 2-2 the pitch. High in the air, and I believe it'll make the seats foul. Brody comes over, looks up, and it's 10 rows in. And Robinson, remember, the last two times has popped out to the first baseman, Clendenin, 
in foul territory, and the Harrelson has been hitting the ball high in the air since that deep fly to center field back in the first. Most valuable player in the National League and in the American League. The only one to do that. And facing Tom Seaver. In a big game, Seaver comes back high inside, popped up, foul again. Brody comes back to the screen, looks, and it drops out of play. Five rows deep. Robinson again hitting Seaver's balls into the air, high, popping them up. Robinson steps up. Seaver has a new ball, walks back to the mound. Boog Powell swinging that big bat while kneeling on deck off to the left. Powell furious after flying to center field on the 3-2 count back in the sixth after he had the count of 3-0. Oh. Seaver ready, 2-2. Two, two. Drive, base hit into left field on a line drive. Down at Cleon Jones bobbles it, goes for it, and Robinson now holds up at first as Jones finally finds the handle and throws into the cutoff man. But the tying run is on base. And big Boog Powell is the batter. That's just the fourth hit of Seaver. And I'm sure you'll recall that at Baltimore, down a run in the ninth inning of the first league championship game, Boog Powell came to bat and hit the home run that tied it up, sent it into extra innings, and Baltimore won that game over Minnesota in impressive fashion, 3-2. to two. Seaver has been talking to Clint Denon, who again trotted over. Chuck McGraw, the left-hander, Ron Taylor, the right-hander, continue to warm for the New York Mets. Powell... Not only trying to tie this game, with one swing, could win it. That's how tense the situation is, and he fouls the first one back, taking a big cut. Strike one. One out in the ninth. One to nothing, New York. Baltimore, its last chance with one out, and Robinson at first. It is Boog Powell who is taking his time, not Seaver on the mound. Powell is back in. Seaver is ready. Here's a pitch. A curveball grounded over the glove of Clendenin. Base hit. Around second base goes Robinson on his way to third. Sabota fires in. That's the cutoff man. And the tying run is at third base with one out. The Orioles have runners at the corner. That's the fifth hit. And Seaver finds himself in trouble with a dangerous Brooks Robinson. A 23 home run hitter during the season, 84 RBIs at the plate. Clendenin comes over, Grody marches out, a double play, and Robinson is slow, as is Powell, Number five. can get the Mets out of it. And now Gil Hodges walks slowly out. But if Robinson should hit the ball out of the infield, Brooks Robinson, Frank Robinson, has the speed and the cunning to score from third base. Gil Hodges, a New York writer, wrote a column about Gil the other day in that big game that Kuzman pitched and won in Baltimore, how Gil could remain so calm, so cool, so collected. He simply walks out, says a few words, Seaver nods in understanding, Hodges walks back, Brody marches back behind the plate, and Brooks Robinson steps in. A ball to the outfield could tie it. McGraw and Taylor continue to throw. In the Met bullpen. One to nothing to score. The Mets. We are in the ninth with one out. Boog Powell has come up with his fourth hit of this series, and it's his biggest thus far. The infield at double play depth. So go to. There's a ball hit to the outfield. Robinson playing it safe. Toronto makes the dive. He's got it. Here comes Robinson in to the plate. He scores. Tie ball game. Soboda. Made a tremendous catch. Had it gotten by him, Powell might have scored all the way from first base. Instead, they're two out, but the game is tied 1-1. One, one. And stepping in is Elrod Hendricks. An appeal play at third base, not allowed by third base umpire Hank Sore. Robinson on the line drive, realizing he could score if it was caught. Stood near third base. Svoboda had to dive for it. He didn't go back on the ball. He cut across toward it. Dove got it in his gloved hand just before he hit the ground. Robinson had time to score as the throw was up the line. Powell held on to first. Two down, 
But now it's a tie game. And here's Hendricks taking outside from Siebert. And so, New York, dreaming of a three-game-to-one lead, must wait for a moment. It's not over yet. Hendricks also has home run power. What a play by Svoboda. Outside again from Siebert. And, of course, if Siebert walks Hendricks, he'll move Powell down in the scoring position. Since game two, the Orioles have scored two runs, and Brooks Robinson has driven them both in. Another pitch. Long drive down the line. Hooking. And it is foul ball, but it is in the seats in the first deck. And Powell will have to come back. And Seaver was a couple of feet away from being behind 3-1 to one in the ninth. Yesterday, Buford hit one down the left field line. That would have brought Baltimore closer. Gil Hodges remains seated, hands in jacket, chewing gum on the bench. And he's got to be blinking at that. Seaver ready again. Two and one to pitch. Low to Hendricks. Three and one, and now Seaver's in danger of moving Powell in the scoring position. One to one the score on two base hits. And a beautiful catch of Sabota by Sabota. Brooks Robinson's line drive, and Robinson scored after the catch. Fouled away by Hendricks. In on the hands, and he fouled it off to the left behind the plate. Three and two. Infield is back. They're pulling Hendricks again to pull to the right. Weiss is way around toward first base. Big hole between Weiss and the shortstop, Harrelson. Seaver ready on 3-2. Long drive. Right field. Savota comes over toward it. Reaches up and takes it to the third out. Ron Savota makes all three putouts. One of those a sensational catch, but it's all tied on the two base hits. And in the middle of the ninth, New York one, Baltimore one. Hi, this is Joe Garagiola for Dodge. And if one month's sales figures can predict the success of a car for the rest of the year, the Dodge boys have a big winner for 1970. The figures for September are in. And now, well, listen to this. The total is way over that of a year ago and establishes a brand new September record for Dodge. Now, one reason for that record-breaking total of Dodge sales has got to be Dodge Coronet. For 1970... Coronet comes on with new styling touches throughout, including its unique double-loop grill and vinyl interior touches. Like luxury, we'll simply say Coronet 500. You get bucket seats, 318 cubic inch V8, three-spoke steering wheel, and more. So get the Coronet story at your Dodge Boys. See him after the game for a test drive. And tell him that Joe Garagiola sent you. Bill O'Donnell along with Jim Simpson getting ready for the bottom of the ninth inning. The Orioles have just tied the Mets at 1-1. And for the Mets in the bottom of the ninth inning, it'll be their two, three, and four batters. Harrelson, Jones, and Clendenin against the right-handed reliever, Eddie Watt, who set down the side in order in the bottom of the eighth inning in relief of Cuellar. Harrelson stepping in, and right with him, Jim Simpson. All right, Bill. Harrelson singled the first time up. Was thrown out on a close play and fouls this ball off. Strike one. It's all up to Eddie Watt now. Tie ball game last of the ninth. With the Mets having their two, three, four hitters coming up. Including Cleon Jones was overdue and Don Clendenin was hit a home run. Watt throws outside and low to the dangerous Bud Harrelson. And it's one and one. A couple of pitchers, including Dick Hall and the left-hander, I believe it's Rickert, throwing in the bullpen for Baltimore. Inside with the slider, but it's on the inside corner, says Shag Crawford. Strike two to White, or Harrelson. Harrelson has had three base hits in 11 times at bat and has walked three times. Outside from Watt, he works very quickly, 2-2. And Bud has been just an excellent fielding shortstop all through this series. It is Hall and Rickard in that bullpen. Ground ball, chopper, all to the glove of Watt. In comes Johnson, side on throw, he's got him. Close play. 
just went over the extended glove of Eddie Watt, breaking off the mound. And Johnson came in, tapped his glove before he got the ball, figuring he had Harrelson all the way. Sat on the throw on and had him. And here is Cleon Jones, a 340 hitter. During the regular season, we will emphasize again, but one for 15 in this the World Series. We said something like that about Frank Robinson in the top of the ninth inning, and Robinson came up with his second hit and scored the tying run. Don Clendenin, the home run hitter, is standing on deck, swinging the weighted bat. One run, five hits, no errors for Baltimore. One run, seven hits, no errors for the Mets. Watt is ready. Breaking pitch outside and low. It's ball one. This is the second inning that Eddie Watt has worked in this World Series. Another breaking pitch, and this misses also. And a check of the record shows that Watt never went more than three innings all year long. He is the short man of the Orioles' relief call. 2-0 the count to Jones. Jones out ahead of Watt, who's running two breaking pitches. Comes back with a hard slider this time and has him, and it's 2-1. the Met fans calming for the moment. They've seen their dreams of a third consecutive win. They'll buy the boards for the moment as Baltimore's tied it up. It's one-to-one in the last of the night. Ground ball. Robinson comes over beyond the 12. Base hit. And Cleon Jones has delivered just as Frank Robinson did with his second hit of the series. And so the go-ahead, the winning run, is on at first base. And Don Pendem in the battle. First hit off Eddie White, the eighth hit for the Mets. Clendenin, back in the second inning, hit a 3-2 pitch to left over the 358-foot side. Now Watt is a right-hander. The National League book on Clendenin is keep the ball in tight. His first home run of this series was hit on a low and away pitch off Dave McNally. Watt ready, throws a breaking pitch, gets the outside corner, and it's strike one. In that game against McNally, Clendenin went with that outside pitch and hit the ball for a home run to right field. Strike one, the count. Jones on it first. Breaking pitch. Fouled off to the right. And it's strike two as it goes deep into the seats behind first base. Well, this has been quite a series. First of all, nobody thought the amazing Mets would win it. They did, took three straight from Atlanta. Lost that first game after Powell tied it with a home run. I'm talking about the Orioles now. They lost the first game to uh, Mike Cuellar 4-1. to one, And everybody said, that's it. But they've come back to take two in a row and have this one within their grasp. Swing and a miss. And Clendenin goes down, and that's the second out and a big one for Eddie White. Boda, who perhaps saved the game with a diving catch of Brooks Robinson's sacrifice line drive, the batter. And more importantly, the last two times up, Swoboda got base hits. This is the first time, though, he has faced the right-hander, Eddie Watt. Swoboda has power, can hit the home run. Watt throws him a breaking pitch, drive to right field, swooping back was Robinson, now in on the dead run, has to tap the ball. And on the third base goes the runner, Cleon Jones, and now with two outs, New York has runners at the corner. Robinson appeared to break back on the ball and then in. And by the time he got in, it was too late. Ed Charles is due up, but Art Shamsky, a 300 hitter and a left-handed hitter, has walked out. The Baltimore infield has shortened up. The outfield has shortened up, figuring that any ball hit deep to the outfield is going to score the winning run anyhow. 
Batting for Charles. Blair is in short center field. Buford and Robinson walking in, in left and right. They only need one out, two outs, with Harrelson's ground out and Clendenin's strikeout, but Jones is perched at third, and Svoboda, who robbed Brooks Robinson of a hit and perhaps saved the game, has kept the Mets alive in this 1-1 game with a Texas League single to right. And Shamsky, the 300 hitter and a good hitter, comes out to face Eddie Watt. Shamsky in the series, still looking for his first base hit. 0 for 4. One run, nine hits, no errors for the Mets. Clendenin had a second inning homer. One run, five hits, no errors for the Orioles, with the Orioles getting their only run in the top of this, the ninth inning. Now Eddie Watt has stepped back on and is ready to pitch to Shamsky. They play him to pull. Swings, ground ball for Johnson. Johnson takes it on the second half, throws to Powell. We go to extra inning. No runs, two hits. No errors and two left at the end of nine. Baltimore one and New York one. With Mr. Dan. I've got an important message for you about cars, even if you don't drive a car. It's about the anti-pollution team. Phillips 66 gasolines and Trop Arctic motor oils. By fighting pollution in a car's engine, they help keep pollution out of the air. So you get a better running engine, and we all get cleaner air. Got the message? Now get the anti-pollution team, only from Phillips 66, where it's performance that counts. Some men have average size hands. Some men have big hands. For men with average hands, Gillette introduces our new adjustable razor with an average size handle. For men with big hands, Gillette introduces our new adjustable razor with a long handle. Both new razors have nine precision settings. Gillette figures a more comfortable razor in your hand means a more comfortable shave. From Shea Stadium in New York, an excited and capacity-filled 57,367 looking on at the first extra-inning World Series game since the fifth game of 1964 when the Cardinals across town at Yankee Stadium beat the Yankees 5-2 to two in 10 innings. The Orioles fighting back, and had they lost this game one to nothing to the Mets, they would have been down three games to one. Now they have a real chance to tie it and even the series at two games apiece. In the tenth inning, Wayne Garrett has gone on to third base to replace Ed Charles. And Dave Johnson, Mark Belanger, and a possible pinch hitter for the Orioles as we move to the tenth. And again, Bill O'Donnell. Thank you, Jim. And Seavers pitched to Johnson. Right down the middle, he piped it for strike one. Johnson is 0 for 3, bounced into a force play, and uh, Jones robbed him of base hit in the fifth inning. He also is struck out. A curve, a slash towards third, through the legs of Garrett, and it's rolling over into foul ground after it bounced fair. Holding at first base is Johnson. A one-hot smash right to the glove and between the legs of Garrett. It either touched the leg or the glove of Garrett and then rolled foul. So a base hit by Johnson through Garrett at third base to begin the top of the 10th inning. Garrett, as Jim told you, just came on to play third defensively for Charles, who was lifted uh, for Shamsky as the pinch hitter in uh, the bottom of the ninth inning. Here in the top of the 10th, Johnson aboard at first base and nobody out, and the batter is Mark Belanger. They've changed it now, and uh, they have charged Garrett with an error. No base hit for Johnson. They pitch out. Johnson was not running. Belanger was squared to bunt. Take away the base hit given to Johnson and instead charge third baseman Garrett with an error. One strike is the count to Belanger. The look to first base by Seaver. Here he fires Belanger, who squares, bunts it up in the air and foul ground, and it's caught by the catcher Brody to the right of home plate, just about 10 feet to the right side. Belanger got his bat under a breaking ball from Seaver. Foul popped it, and Grody squeezed it for the out. Clay Dalrymple will make a pinch-hitting appearance now in the top of the 10th inning. 
Dalrymple, who was with the Phillies in 1968 and who was acquired during the winter for a minor league outfielder, Ron Stone. Dalrymple has made an appearance before in this series and has had an infield base hit. Weiss smothered uh, the ground ball, but Dalrymple wound up with the base hit. One away, Belanger attempting to bunt and sacrifice, trying to move Johnson to uh, second base, has just fouled out. Dick Hall is working in the Oriole bullpen. Dalrymple bats from the left side, and Seaver throws him low, ball one. Clendenin is checking against Johnson at first base. One away in the top of the 10th inning. Orioles and the Mets in a 1-1 tie in the fourth game of the series. The set at the belt by Seaver. His pitch. Here's a line drive. Base hit out into center field. Johnson heads for second. Stays there. A.G. throws towards third base. The Orioles have two aboard with one out. And they bring up Don Buford. So Dalrymple has come to the plate twice during the World Series as a pinch hitter and twice has delivered a base hit. Rube Walker, the Mets pitching coach, coming to the mound, asking Seaver if he's strong, trying to find out if he's tired. The Mets have left and right-handers warming in the bullpen, Taylor the right-hander and McGraw the left-hander. Walker has had the few quick words with both Brody and Seaver, and now Rube going back to additionally chat with his manager, Gil Hodges. The only inning in which Seaver had trouble early in the ball game was in the third, and then he got in trouble again in the ninth. Seaver's in a jam again here in the tenth. Dalrymple at first, Johnson off second. Buford batting from the left side is thrown a low curve by Seaver, ball one. Johnson is Baltimore's go-ahead run here in the top of the 10th inning off second place, uh, plus Dalrymple off first. Fastball. Here's a high fly. Deep, deep right field. Svoboda's on the warning track. He makes the catch. Johnson tags at second. Johnson's on his way to third. The ball is cut off at second base by the shortstop, Harrelson. So runners are at the corners, but Seaver picks up his second down. Svoboda backed about 15 feet on the warning track in dead right field. Two away, and that will bring on Paul Blair. Blair has been a base runner twice against Seaver, with a single in the first inning, with a walk in the sixth inning. Blair has only two hits in this series. He's played tight at third, wide of the line by Garrett. When Denon is holding against the runner at first base, Dalrymple. Johnson coming a couple of steps down the line at third. Seaver looks to third, checks over the other shoulder to first. Throws, a swing and a big miss. Blair took as hard a rip as he could, and Seaver's ahead of him. One strike with two out and two on. Frank Robinson is on deck. Garrett bluffs uh, Johnson back towards third. Dave leads off the bag. The pitch to Blair. Swings and misses again. Seaver reaching back for something extra and popping fastballs past Blair. Two strikes to Blair. Dalrymple the runner at first. Johnson is off third. Seaver checking Brody's wigwagging. Takes a quick glance to first base. Sets. Delivers on two. A curve, it just missed the outside corner. He took something off the breaking pitch and couldn't bite the outer edge of the plate. Blair a couple of waves of the bat. Seaver glancing over the left shoulder again. Blair on one and two. Swing, an outside curve, and Seaver gets out of a serious jam in the top of the 10th inning. No runs, one hit for Baltimore, one error for the Mets, two left in the middle of the 10th inning. New York one and Baltimore one. Second floor, refrigerators, formerly $195, now $215 going up. If you had a fire in your home today and had to replace everything, this is what you'd find when you went shopping. Third floor, living room sofas, formerly $210, now $225 going up. Basic things have gone up 5, 10, 20 percent. 
Then there's the cost of your house itself. This is why the Hartford invented Inflation Guard, the first homeowner's insurance policy that protects you against inflation automatically. To keep up with rising replacement costs, the Hartford boosts the value of your policy every three months. Sixth floor, Ron. New Inflation Guard. The way prices are always going up, can you afford to be without it? Insurance by the Hartford. We try to keep things simple. We pause 30 seconds for station identification. WGY Schenectady. Saratoga ginger ale is not Saratoga Vichy with ginger flavor added. We're not sure where that rumor got started, though we have our ideas. In any event, what Saratoga ginger ale is, is a quite unusual, delicious drink with its own identity altogether. It's gingery without being snappish, mellow without being gooey, altogether luscious. But then the Saratoga people do everything in good taste. From New York Shea Stadium, Jim Simpson with Bill O'Donnell, Big Dick Hall, six two and a half, a veteran of the major leagues and 39 years old, has come on to pitch. Five and two on the year, fine earn run average of 1.91. And if you'll recall, Hall in that first game of the league championships was a hero in the series between the Orioles and Minnesota. This game is all tied at 1-1. And we are in the last of the 10th inning with Brody Weiss and Seaver listed to bat against Hall. Eddie Watt came on, pitched two innings, did not give up a run. The Mets have only one, as do the Orioles. Gave up two hits and struck out two and was in trouble in the ninth inning until they got the pinch hitter, Art Shamsky, to bounce to Johnson to get him out of it. So now we are in the last of the 10th. And here is Jerry Grody and Bill O'Donnell. Dick Hall during the regular season for the Orioles, made a total of 39 relief appearances at an earned run average of less than two runs a game. He has outstanding control, and his statistics prove it. Only nine walks in 66 innings of work. Pitching to the Mets and to Grody in the 10th. A foul straight back by Grody for strike one. Hall has a sneaky slider and a sneaky fastball. He is not overpoweringly quick with the fastball. He's just sneaky quick. One strike delivery. He changes up and goes outside high. One ball and one strike. Watt went two innings in relief of starter Mike Cuellar. Here's Hall, one and one to Grody. It's high and gets away from catcher Hendricks. Two balls and one strike. Brody fanned twice against Cuellar, looking in the second, swinging in the fifth, and rolled out in the seventh inning to shore. Hauled into his windup, leaning forward and rearing back. Throws. Here's a high pop-up down the right field foul side. Johnson chasing, Powell chasing. They won't get to it. It's way down the right field side now to play in the seats. Paul had... Uh, a new lease on baseball life for 1969 after being cut loose by the Phillies to become a free agent. 2-2 two -two pitch. He's high and tight to make it 3-2. and two. Paul did not have a contract when he went to spring training with Baltimore and Miami and pitched his way on the Baltimore staff to come back with the club and gain a contract. The pay pitch to Grody. Swings and hits a fly ball out into left field. Buford with a late start. Buford coming. He won't get to it, nor does Belanger. The throw is to second base and not in time. Brody slides in with a two-bagger. Belanger went back and a sky-high looping fly ball out into left field. Fairly shallow in left field. Buford stood flat-footed, made a late charge on the ball. Buford actually was further away from the ball than was Belanger, and Belanger just could not reach it. Buford may have lost the flight of the ball in the sun. Buford recovered, threw to Johnson at second base, but late to get the sliding Grody, but the throw was right on the target. Now Grody will be lifted for a pinch runner with a winning run for the Mets at second base. Rod Gasper will run, will run for Grody. There are 
There's nobody out in the bottom of the 10th inning. Al Weiss is now the man on the spot. Weiss has two base hits today, has four hits in the series, and Seaver is on deck. The two-bagger by Grody is the first double in the ballgame. Grody has been lifted. Gasper is the runner. And they will walk Weiss intentionally for a play at any base in the infield on the ground ball. Ball one has been thrown wide to Weiss. Ball throwing the second one wide for ball two. Harden, right-hander. Rickard, left-hander, still firing in the Oriole bullpen. Here is ball three wide. And a quick throw to second base by Hendricks as Gasper was two steps away from the bag and then got back. 3-0 on the fourth intentional pitch for ball four. Weiss has drawn an intentional walk. That is also the first walk given up by Baltimore pitching today. They are going to pull... They are going to pull Tom Seaver. J.C. Martin, who is a left-handed batter, Martin is being sent from the dugout... George Bamberger, the Oriole pitching coach, is also coming out of the Baltimore dugout. The Orioles have had Harden and Rickard throwing out in their left field bullpen the last two innings. The strategy to walk Weiss because the, the important man is Gasper at second base. So the Orioles figure if they get a ground ball to the infield, they've got a force situation at either third or second. Bamberger has gone to the mound. Bamberger has not gone to his bullpen. As Bamberger walks towards the dugout, he starts looking to Billy Hunter, then walks back. Billy Hunter has been running the Oriole Ball Club, and Bamberger has pointed to the bullpen for the left-hander, Pete Rickard. Rickard and Watt are considered the co-captains of the Oriole Bullpen. They are the late-inning reliefers. Rickard, a former National Leaguer of many years ago who was with the Dodgers, then came to the American League with Washington, then came to the Orioles in the deal that uh, Baltimore and Washington pulled off when Rickert was exchanged for Mike Epstein. Jim? J.C. Martin, and I don't know now whether or not he will bat. We'll have to wait to see after Rickert gets in. Martin is a left-handed batter, but I'll recall for you that in Atlanta, with an extra base hit as a pinch hitter and one of the moves by Gil Hodges, Martin, with an extra base hit, cleared the bases and helped break that first game of the league championships wide open. Now, remember the situation in this one-to-one -one ball game of New York out in front in games, two games to one. There is nobody out. Gasper is on at second base. Weiss, with the intentional walk, is on at first base. And it might be that J.C. Martin will be allowed to bat, but to bunt, simply to move them over into scoring position. So that just a ball hit to the outfield or deep to the infield could score. J.C. Martin will bat. Men at first and second, none out. Last of the tenth, one to one. The Mets trying to move out in front, three games to one. Martin could be up to bunt. Bill? Jim, the left hand arm of Pete Rickard out of the Oriole bullpen against the left hand swinging pinch hitter, J.C. Martin. Runners for the Mets at second and at first, and nobody out. He squares, he bunts down the first baseline. Rickard Fields throws, and it hits the runner. Here's the runner coming on from third base, Jasper, and the Mets win the ball game by a score of two to one. Rickard took the bunt through to first base, but it hit J.C. Martin on the leg before it got to the bag. Jasper was running from second to third. When Gasper saw Rickard throw, hit Martin, and the ball then came towards the left of the first base foul line into the infield, Gasper kept right on coming, and Gasper has scored. And the Mets in the 10th inning have won the fourth game of the World Series by a score of 2-1. to one. And the Mets now lead in the World Series three victories to one. The final score of the fourth game of the World Series again, New York 2, Baltimore 1. Jim Simpson along with Bill O'Donnell and wherever you are, overseas with our armed forces or in Latin or Central America, we hope that you will be with us tomorrow for the game between 
Baltimore and the New York Mets. Baltimore won the first game 4-1, to one, but since then it's been all the Mets. 2-1 to one with Kuzman the winner. 5 to nothing with Gentry the winner yesterday. And Seaver winning in 10 innings, 2-1 to one today. Jim Simpson with Bill O'Donnell from Shea Stadium, New York. The Mets lead it three games to one. The final score once again in the fourth game of the World Series, New York 2, Baltimore 1, and 10 innings. This has been an NBC Radio Network production. Baseball is-